of you who are on the line, um, thank you for joining us. We are going to, I'm going to call the meeting to order of the Castro Valley Unified School District Board of Education. I'm, I've looked on the public comment and I do not see any public comments regarding closed session items. Given that, we will recess to closed session and then the board will return to open session to hear the remainder of the topics at 7 p.m. And that's the same line for those of you who have joined us this afternoon now. Um, we'll be back at 7 p.m. Thank you so much and we will see you then. Thank you. Star nine, to request to speak when public comment is being taken on the eligible agenda item. You will then be unmuted during your turn and allowed to make public comment. After the allotted time, you will then be re-muted. So that's the way that it's gonna work tonight. And individual speakers are asked to limit their comments to no more than three minutes. So just so you're aware, you'll have, have a three minute clock. And there are up to 30 minutes of public comment allowed on each agenda item, but with board consensus, uh, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed. So just so that you're all aware on the line, I do see that, that we are joined by um, many of our community tonight. So welcome. And this meeting is being recorded to prepare the official minutes. So I'm going to hand it over to Superintendent Amadi um, to start us off tonight. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to um, just say that because we knew we have uh, a lot of wonderful community members interested, um, Amy did her magic again and figured out a way uh, just for um, this time to actually up us uh, to 3,000. So we should be fine. Um, again, thank you, Amy. Uh, uh, let me get um, started by, we have a presentation for you tonight. I want to start by really reminding everybody um, that this is, as we have talked about, unprecedented, unpredictable pandemic. Um, and I think once we really look at all of the things that we've been dealing with the last few months and hearing what we are hearing uh, moving forward, it kind of, uh, it humbles us. Um, so there are very, I mean, there's so many unique circumstances that every family faces, every organization, every uh, person uh, during this time. And um, there are lots of difficulties that people are facing. Um, and we as public educators and in public education have a really important role um, in uh, supporting our, our students, our families, our community, and our staff um, and really um, just globally, um, everything that every one of us does impacts a whole lot of other things. Um, we have and we will continue to work directly and closely with the Department of Public Health. Uh, for example, um, on today's call, we have a call every Thursday, but we are also, they're also available to us anytime. If I have a question, um, we talked about uh, they really reminded us um, of the importance of getting students back to school and the, uh, the, the difficulties that, that students are having just in general for not being in school. If nothing else, I have to say, what has happened with this pandemic has taught us the value of human connection, the value of public education, because I think you know, maybe in the past we would say, wouldn't it be nice, everybody could just learn online and everybody would just be fine and everything is technology. Technology is fabulous, but technology doesn't replace human connection. And the wonderful job that our staff and our teachers and, and custodians and office staff and our principals do. Um, 
So tonight we're talking about um, two options that families have because we want to make sure um, that we meet as many needs as possible. Um, and I, um, I really want to thank the planning groups, the, the teachers, the staff, the principals, administrators who've been involved in this. I want to thank the families for giving us a lot of great questions and feedback. Um, so the options that we're, uh, we're giving you um, are for consideration tonight. Uh, there are lots of other details that we are figuring out and we're working on lots and lots. But until we have a plan that we're looking at, it's not as easy to work on all of those different pieces. So that's why it's important for us. It's been really important for us to get to this point where we can then move forward and put all of those things in place. So just so I will let you know what we're gonna cover um, in other areas later on, um, but lots of details that we're working on. Um, I also wanna start us by saying, I know that we've read the questions and comments that people have sent in. Um, I know there were questions about the date for, the, uh, for moving into hybrid and, and all of that. I want to say one of the most important things I want to remind us of that is that we have to be flexible when it comes to pivoting back and forth from different models, depending on health conditions, right? Um, so, and if you remember, um, when we get started with the presentation, I'll go on some of the things that, that are really important for us to remember from legislation uh, that was passed. So the date that we have in there is approximate, but we really have to think about some, some date, some timeline, so that we can actually put this plan together and say, so for so many weeks, we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna move to this hybrid, and then, when we need to, we move back, but we have tried both. We know how to do both. We have trained people. We have trained our, our students. We have uh, our, our staff feels really, feel really confident. Um, so that day could move back based on what happens in our conversation with the health department. Um, so we will work with that. At that. Before that time, we will do that. We will go over our plan with the, uh, with the health department again to make sure. And then we'll look at cases. We'll look at their guidance. Um, again, it's important for us to be able to pivot. Um, and with that, I, um, what I would like to do uh, before I turn it over to, to our team, uh, there are a couple of um, slides. Amy, if you could come to the next slide. Uh, before we, um, I go over this, I want to say, uh, just kind of share the process with you tonight. So we will be presenting and halfway through there is a slide that says question. Those, that's time for the board to ask uh, clarifying questions. And then we'll do the rest of the presentation with more clarifying questions for the board to ask any uh, clarifying questions they have. Um, and then after that, um, I will add just a couple of things to wrap us up. Um, then uh, once that's finished, we will have public comments. Uh, from people who have raised their hands. Um, after we hear the comments, then uh, there will be a motion and a second, and then of course discussion by the board and, uh, and the rest of the uh, process, which is um, you know, consideration of approval. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knows how this is gonna go. So I, I put our principles down here that you have seen before. Again, safety, number one, our first priority and the fact that we'll monitor and remain in compliance with all of the guidelines and regulations that we have. We'll follow a phased in approach um, as we've talked about and then be able to pivot and flex. Next. Uh, so just, just a couple of reminders. There are mandates that we have and there are guidance that we have from the County Public Health Department um, again, working with them closely, uh, those are all uh, recommendations are based on public health data, um, and they um, actually um, have been very, very helpful to us um, in giving us some time to figure out what our plans look like. Uh, mandates that we have under law, um, SB Senate Bill 98 that passed, uh, tra uh, trailer bills that passed um, with the Budget Act, um, that said that, uh, that we need to um, have in place. 
there will also be guidance that may come from the public health uh, officer that uh, at times that would basically tell us, you know, you, you need to shut down um, at this point. Uh, that's not what we are hearing. Next slide. Uh, so this is from Senate Bill 98. Um, as you know, on June 26th, the legislature uh, passed legislature passed uh, the State Budget Act with several uh, bills, as I said. And just to remind everybody, SB 98 adds Education Code Section 43500 uh, through 504, containing detailed um, information. There are pages and pages that we've read, but basically. The comment, the, the gist of it is that school districts shall offer in-person instruction and may offer distance learning pursuant to the requirement on, uh, of Education Code 43502. And um, again, districts shall offer in-person instruction to the greatest extent possible. Um, also, they had information on distance learning uh, that it, it's allowed under these two circumstances. Uh, and there's also a lot of information on what distance learning and in-person learning would look like. Um, again, a lot of other details around attendance and grading and all of that that uh, we'll cover some of. Um, next slide. Uh, these are just slides that we had uh, shared with you before. Um, so I won't spend much time going over them as they have been posted and they've been available to you. But this is, the, this is when we ask questions of community members uh, about what options they would like to have. Next slide. And I'm not gonna read them. This was for elementary. I went over all of these in detail last time. And then next slide is secondary. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Ryman. Uh, before we do that, I want to say, I know there are lots of questions about safety and procedures. We, will, we have lots of details to work through and we are absolutely, that's our number one priority once we have the plan. We've already been working on it. So there will be a lot of information that will come your way, um, not only in presentations in the future, but also information we're going to continue to communicate with you. So I know I'm asking for a lot of patience and I thank you for that. You have been extremely patient and if you just, uh, we appreciate your questions and then we'll make sure that uh, our FAQs that are on um, our website, we will update uh, soon so that you have some of that information. But safety, I know, is on top of everyone's mind. And that is something that we're going to give you more information later on. Dr. Ryman. Thank you, Superintendent Omadi. Um, I appreciate that, that information. Um, as Superintendent Omadi indicated earlier, uh, this has been a very complex process that's involved a lot of people. Um, the information that we're sharing tonight uh, is the result of planning committees that have worked throughout the past several months, including teachers, counselors, administrators, other certificated staff as well, dozens on the elementary group here you see listed, and next slide, please. And even dozens more working on the secondary group as well. Um, so this has truly been a, a collective effort um, by dozens of people. Next slide, please. That has taken place over the last several months. So beginning in the spring, uh, both of the elementary and the secondary planning committees began meeting. Um, and considering information from themselves, but also bringing in information uh, from parent groups through the, staff, through the parent survey, uh, other staff members through the staff survey, consulting with parent groups such as uh, presenting information and getting input from the parent leadership, uh, parent leadership advisory committee, um, and then also making sure to bring, uh, bring in all the latest best information uh, from the Alameda County Department of Health, Alameda County Office of Education, uh, and the California Department of Education. Uh, next slide, please. And so what those two committees have arrived at are recommendations that are broken up into two pieces. Uh, what you'll be getting, having presented tonight 
uh, are two options, a pre-K through 12 main option, as well as an alternative option. Uh, for the presentation of the main option, um, you'll see a phased approach uh, in which phase one uh, will involve virtual learning along with in-person supports for our students with disabilities uh, and other students with specific needs and supports. Um, that would take place from August 13th through September 11th. Then there will be time for uh, clarifying questions from the board, followed by a presentation of phase two, which is our blended learning options uh, for elementary and for secondary. That would start on September 14th. Uh, as Superintendent Amadi indicated before, those dates are the dates we are using as of now. The planning committees are still continuing to meet. We're still continuing to get more information uh, and will be responsive. Uh, also, you'll be hearing about an alternative option. Uh, at the elementary level, this looks like full year 100% remote learning. Uh, at the elementary level, it will look like Castro Valley Virtual Pathway, uh, which is an elementary program that's being designed specifically uh, in response to this need. Uh, at the secondary level, we already have the Castro Valley Virtual Academy. Uh, we're making adjustments and expanding that program so that it can accommodate more, but you'll hear more detail about that tonight, but also moving forward, additional details as Superintendent Amadi uh, explained earlier will be forthcoming concerning all of these options. Next slide, please. Um, also, as we move through the presentation, there will be a few key terms. Um, these are lots of terms, so I'll spend time just looking at a few of them. The first being synchronous activities. Uh, synchronous activities or synchronous learning, those are the activities and the types of instruction in which a teacher is live and in real time presenting information, interacting with students, uh, guiding them through uh, lessons. Um, this, examples of this could be social emotional supports, could be first direct instruction, could be reviewing and reteaching, or it could be live interventions. Uh, you'll also hear about asynchronous activities and asynchronous instruction. Asynchronous instruction are the activities in the learning where lessons are, are prepared ahead of time uh, and students complete those lessons independent of the teacher and or staff member. Uh, this allows flexibility in terms of timing, in terms of when, where, and how students may complete these activities. Um, this could include instruction of concepts, practice, but in all of those activities that would take place while the teacher may be teaching live instruction to another cohort. And thirdly, looking at social emotional learning. Uh, over the past couple of years, if you've been coming to board meetings, which I know the board members have been, uh, you've heard a lot about social emotional learning and social emotional supports from us. Uh, this is learning that focuses on emotional supports, uh, helping with behaviors and positive behaviors and other social skills. In addition to that, our social emotional learning in this context includes anti-bias lessons uh, and help to make sure that we have a, self, a, a safe and welcoming environment for everyone. Um, so those are really the key terms, but we also hope that you'll take a moment uh, if you already have the board packet and you're unfamiliar with any of these terms, especially uh, the public, if you haven't, um, if you're a parent or community members, you may, you may not be. So we wanted to provide those to you. Uh, next slide. So as we move into our next phase, I want to introduce a few key people. Um, first of which is Nia Rashishi, our Director of Education for Elementary. Uh, Vivian Peritor, our Director of Education for Secondary. And Susie Williams, our Director of Special Education. Uh, and without further ado, Ms. Rashishi. Thank you, Dr. Ryman, and um, good evening, everybody. Um, I want to reiterate that the elementary and uh, secondary planning teams have worked really diligently to, I mean, they've done so, so much research and uh, looking at webinars and um, having deep discussions and doing a lot of planning, um, super committed people that I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to call myself a part of um, the elementary team. Um, we did some good work and the recommendations um, are, as Dr. Ryman said, uh, we're, we're recommending a phased in, uh, phased in approach. And it starts with the main option where we're starting with phase one, virtual learning, um, and then transitioning into phase two, 
um, in an AM PM blended learning model. And we want to really um, tonight, we'll talk about how we've kind of upped our virtual learning game um, from the, the past two and a half months um, where we had for last school year. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then last but not least, the alternative option, which is a full year of 100% uh, remote learning, where we know in uh, some of the feedback that we've gotten from some of our families, is that we really, um, some families are just feeling like, you know what, I want 100% remote learning all year long and that's what I wanna do. And so we, uh, we, are, we are building, this is new at the elementary level for us. And, and we thought, well, let's then provide that option. So um, we're going to, and um, we're, we're, we're also proud of that um, um, particular um, piece. So um, next slide. And then the secondary team also came up with a phased in approach. Um, the main option, again, very aligned to the elementary team, starting with virtual learning and then transitioning phase two into a choice really tonight for the board to look at the blended learning um, AB model or the 10-4 model. And then again, an alternative um, learning option with, our, with CVVA, which most people are familiar with that has been around for a while. Next slide. So one of the main questions that we get is, what does it look like? Um, next slide. And before we jump specifically into what it looks like, we wanted to talk a little bit about, I said a little bit earlier, how we've um, kind of upped our virtual, built our virtual muscle. Um, if you all remember that um, as in mid-May, excuse me, mid-March of last school year, we were really asked to um, transition a brick and mortar system fully into a virtual learning system. And so it was a lot of emergency planning. A lot of teachers went, uh, did an amazing job of really taking a system that's been in place for quite, quite a long time and transitioning that to a virtual um, um, environment. Um, it wasn't perfect, but we did a lot of good work. Um, but that was emergency planning. We've now transitioned into and um, had some time to do some more strategic planning and up our virtual game. So part of that planning involved partnering with Modern Teacher to increase our proficiency and our consistency. Um, Modern Teacher is an organization that works with school districts to help build systems to seamlessly transition between brick and mortar and virtual learning and then back again. Um, and so we, we have done some partnership with Modern Teacher to start continuing to build our muscle. Part of that learning has been um, to provide some professional development for our staff on virtual, learn, um, virtual instruction and uh, with going through modules this summer like architecting a dig digital learning environment and architecting a blended online lesson block foundation. What does that look like? What does it feel like? How do we become more engaging in a virtual setting? Um, also, we've done a lot of instructional technology professional learning with our um, staffs. The Google Suite has become um, a, a big friend of ours. Um, Google Suite includes Google Meets, Google Classroom, um, uh, and, and um, uh, Google Docs. So, and then a, a little bit of a new phase, some of the f uh, feedback that we got from our families were, you know what? We're really asking you to step up and be our, continue to be our good partners, um, but we need some help on that. And we also need to um, build our skill in the Google Suite, not for everybody, because we know that some people already have that skill, um, but um, we are going to be starting in the month of July, this month um, to provide professional learning to our families on how to use Google Classroom, on how to use Google Docs, and on how to uh, use Google Meets, um, so that we're all becoming more proficient together. And then last but not least, we have um, a partnership with Alameda County Office of Education, where we're doing some research, going to put some piloting in place and then select eventually sometime um, during this school year, um, a learning management system that will hold our teaching and learning assessment and accountability system in one place from a comprehensive perspective. So we're not there yet, but we're working on getting there. Next slide. And so again, just a few things to point out um, as far as we were building our virtual muscle. Um, we, uh, you'll see in the schedules that you see um, recommended for tonight that there is now daily virtual live instruction on a daily basis, um, that there is a consistent schedule across our elementary schools. Families asked for that so that they could help again to be partners in better partners in this work. Um, that there is a summer work group constructing a synchronous playlist. That, has been an immense amount of work this, um, uh, this summer. We've had grade levels and departments and our social emotional um, uh, work groups of teachers really working hard on creating asynchronous, which, uh, you know, vir basically virtual lesson plans that include a similar cadence that follows 
learn about it, practice it, and then evidence of learning. So you'll hear more about that tonight. And then last, I won't read all of these to you, but just the expectation that all of our um, um, teachers will be synchronously learning for with F synchronous learning will be provided for every student. So more to come on that, but um, next slide. Okay, so again, now what does it look like at the elementary level? There's two big chunks in the day. You've got synchronous learning, which is that live and direct instruction that the teacher is doing directly with our students. Um, and that's a big chunk of time in the morning time. And then you have on the other side of the afternoon, asynchronous learning, which again, Dr. Ryman went over those definitions. Asynchronous meaning the student is doing learning independent of the general ed teacher. Um, and, um, and we'll talk more about that and in this next slide. And here's the actual schedule of what it looks like. Um, so I'll go over this Monday through Thursday from eight to 11 o'clock, a day in the life. This is a student schedule. So if this is from the student perspective. Um, teacher would be doing a social emotional check-in. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to see you. There might be some type of enrichment activity, like a guest speaker or some type of virtual study trip. Um, and, and just checking on, you know, how everybody's doing for the day. That's about 20 minutes. And then there's kind of directions for the day. Here's what we're going to be doing today. And then there's a two hour block there where we're teaching, reviewing, reteaching and intervention and providing intervention where the teacher again is working live, live with our students, either whole group or in small group uh, rotations, um, depending on what students need. But that's a two hour trunk to work on math and reading language arts. And then, of course, we have our designated English learner support for our English learners. Um, that's that's um, specific time set aside to do that work. So that's the morning in a nutshell. And then we move after those three hours, students will move into their asynchronous time um, at the bottom of uh, bottom half of the page. And you see that instruction review of concepts through video and then practice activities. So again, that's that. So there's a video of learning a new concept. That's that learn about it and then practice it. There's some skills and activities that we're asking students to carry out. And then there's an evidence of learning piece to kind of like show what you know. Tell us, did you get it or didn't you get it? So that when we're reviewing the teaching live, we can know where students need help. Okay, and then after that part, we have the specialists kick in. And we have our RTI specialists that are working with those students who are most in need. And then we have our single subject specialists, our PE teachers, our science teachers, our music teachers, and our, our counselors who are going to help with that social, emotional, and anti-bias curriculum. That kicks in, those folks kick in with our students in that afternoon time. And in a nutshell, that's Monday through Thursday. For Friday, it looks similar, but there's a little bit more time in the morning time. So we'll go back to that synchronous activity on Friday. We've got that social emotional check-in, enrichment activity, and directions for the day, but we have a little bit of a longer period of time to do that on Friday. <clears throat> and we have our designated English learner support time. Um, and then we get into two pockets of time with, this, with the student where student is, uh, teacher is checking in with um, either one-on-one -on -one or one-on small group students to intervene where they're seeing that maybe a student is having some challenges someplace and we really want to work on those challenges in a small group setting. And then also providing some time office hours with parents. Parents have a question about a lesson, not sure about a certain activity or project, and there's time set aside on the schedule to make sure that parents have a chance to check in with teachers. And then in the afternoon time, again, we have that continuous practice where students are in that asynchronous time, finishing up activities for the week, um, and then also the specialists kick in again, um, working with our students. So that in a nutshell is the main option, phase one of our virtual learning. That's the description there. Next slide. And then we wanted to make sure that um, we did, we um, said, you know, sometimes we have questions about, so we, what, when our students are in that asynchronous learning in the afternoon, what are our teachers doing? And they've got a lot on their plate. Um, there's a lot of learning that we still need to do. There's a lot of preparation that we still need to do to make sure that our virtual learning is spot on, um, that our virtual teaching and learning um, work um, continues to be um, finely tuned and tweaked. Um, so you see preparing learning materials and activities, um, reviewing and providing feedback on student practice. So our teachers need time to do that. On our grading system is going to be back up and running and checking for understanding. We're going to include those concepts back into our, our, our virtual environment. Supporting our parents. Again, you saw office hours on Friday. We have office hours built in for teachers to work with parents Monday through Friday. 
Um, and then we, of course, want to make sure that our teachers always have time to um, have collaboration, work with their grade level teams, um, and then continue to professionally develop. Um, that's Monday through Thursday. On Fridays, we built in staff meeting time and professional learning communities. That's what PLC means. Again, more collaboration time. We need our grade levels to be working together, continuing to build that virtual muscle, continuing to build together in a collaborative um, way the lessons that we want our students to have. Um, there's principal office hours, there's more prep time, and then some formal professional development that will either um, be um, specifically at the site or from a district-wide perspective. So that's kind of the teacher schedule in the afternoon. They're teaching live in the morning and then in the afternoon, this, these are the activities that they're carrying out. Okay, next slide. So phase one, a continued, one of the things that our teachers really wanted to do is to make sure that we get to know our students from the very beginning of the school year. And so we have talked about, um, you know, organizing those small, uh, small in-person student teacher meet and greets. Um, building it so that we can build relationships with our students um, that we can explain the cadence how is the general flow of the day going to run so that they really understand that um, and that our families understand that as well um, we will carry out some of the academic and social emotional assessments we really think it's important from the beginning of the year that we get a real feel for where our students ended up at the end of the um, 1920 school year so um, we want to make sure that we carry out some assessments from the beginning of the year and know exactly where we're starting from with all our students and then we also, again, want to provide some additional technology training for our parents. They've asked for that, we're, and we're, we're going to be responsive to that and, and make sure that that happens. Um, and as, um, as, as um, Superintendent Amadi said, you know, the, you know, can we do this in person? We'll, we'll be used being the guide of the Alameda County Health Department to determine whether that can be in person or you know, do we have to transition to it, that being virtual? But no matter what, our teachers were very emphatic about making sure that we are um, getting to know our students at the very beginning of the year. Next slide. Okay, and then I'm gonna hand it off to my um, colleague, Ms. Vivian Perator, to talk about the secondary work. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. So um, this, this shows um, our option one, which is complete and phase one, our secondary virtual instruction. So all the instruction is done virtually with the exception of some students who will physically come to school to receive intervention services, counseling help um, or help with accessing online instruction or to get materials and books. So some students will come to school in small groups to receive those services. Next slide, please. And this is a, a, a visual representation of what our uh, schedule will look like. So this is a sample schedule and the times may vary slightly, but from school to school. However, this represents a consistent schedule of synchronous instruction. Um, so the synchronous instruction is in the morning with the remainder of the day being asynchronous learning. It's gonna be uh, also an intervention and advisory period. We will, uh, we will stop after Mrs. Williams' presentation for questions on phase one. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the Director of Special Education, Mrs. Susie Williams, with the next slide, please. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much. Um, we have been working very closely with both the secondary and elementary teams um, to ensure that uh, we're following uh, the same pattern as them. So for the majority of our about 1,100 students in special education, the majority of them are fully included in general education and as such will be participating uh, in the plans that you just heard presented. Um, so they will be doing both the virtual learning and the blended learning. Um, you can see what was presented in the plan is that there are designated times for our direct service providers, uh, our individuals such as our speech and language pathologists, occupational therapists, behaviorists, and for those related services, we will be working to provide those, delivering them both remotely and in person. So they will be delivered even for our students who are fully included in general education in person to the greatest extent possible. Um, and that is because those, again, will be following current health and safety guidelines. Um, for a group of our students, about 150 of our students who are involved in our special day classes, um, 
we know that it's very important to get these students back into school um, as soon as possible. Um, they have been receiving uh, virtual instruction, but we know uh, for many of the, uh, much of the curriculum, many of the activities that they do on a daily basis, that it's important for them to receive instruction in person. So our goal will be um, small group instruction. Most of the classes are already fairly small in size, but we will be following um, guidelines in terms of the number of individuals in the classrooms, including the staff uh, that will be present. Um, there will be small group instruction and some modified days uh, in the beginning uh, as we um, bring everything back um, into place. Um, obviously, for any of our students who are medically fragile or immunocompromised, um, we will also be uh, able to offer a um, virtual instruction for them um, based specifically on their IEPs and if, how that can be delivered for them. So next slide, please. Um, so the specific classes that um, we're talking about, um, you can see at both the elementary and secondary level. Um, and these are our students that we know will benefit greatly from having in-person instruction um, on a daily basis. Um, and so you can see that we have approximately six mild mod classes um, and seven what we call mod severe classes. And so we will um, at the elementary level and then at the secondary level, um, you can see we have nine of our mild SDC and six mod severe classes. Um, again, those classes span from preschool through our adult transition program. And uh, as I mentioned before, for these students, um, we will be bringing them back in for in-person instruction um, as soon as possible and um, allowed and per um, regulations that we have for health and safety. Uh, we've been working with teams uh, to make sure that we have everything in place uh, to have the students back on campus and also um, to the greatest extent possible following the programs um, for our general ed students that will allow for when the time comes our students to be able to begin participating in um, their mainstreaming classes and as permitted their um, community-based instruction classes, which are very important to our students. Um, and uh, as we uh, spoke about before, um, there'll be a time for any further questions. We do have work groups that will be convening next week um, that will include our teachers so that we can get planning and get information around schedules dates and times um, out to our parents as soon as possible. So thank you very much. And I'll be turning this back over to my colleagues now. So well, I have, uh, as we get started, I see you dot, I just wanted to say something um, before we get started. Wanted to thank everybody for all of their work on this and realizing that we understand how impossible this is and also wanting to recognize all of the comments that we receive from a varied group of parents, teachers, staff, and community members and empathize that they're all coming from different places of need, of dealing with so many other things. We're collectively dealing with an awful situation. And so I want to thank everybody for their comments and I want to thank the team for working so great with the unions and I want to thank the unions for working so great with the district. I think that this is amazing the work that you've been able to do together um, and, and I applaud you for um, the great relationship that you've developed together and how you work well together. So thank you for that. I do have further questions but I do want to let the board ask their questions so I'll go to Dot and then to Jill. So I have um well, at least two questions. Um, one, what is the parent technology training going to look like? Um, is it going to be led by the, the classroom teacher? Is it going to be led by someone campus wide? Um, so that's my first question. And then um, for parents who, so we're starting the school year virtually. For parents who want to um, stay 100% virtual, Will be, they be attached to a classroom 
will they have that kind of community connection or will they, you know, be in their virtual world? So, I, oh, go ahead. So I was just going to say, and, and Nina and Vivian can probably say more than, than I could in detail about the elementary and secondary plans. Um, but first of all, some of those pieces are still being developed in terms of the details. Mm -hmm. But in terms of overview, uh, the, the plan is for, at the secondary level, students would be enrolled at CVVA. For those students, they are enrolled in an actual program with teachers who are teaching those courses uh, who they would interact with uh, on a regular basis. Um, weekly ba a weekly basis is the standard for CVVA right now. As well as for elementary, uh, the plan would be for daily live interaction uh, via the internet with a teacher. So they would be enrolled in a class with a teacher. They would see a teacher at live, not in person, but live via the internet each day. Um, and I don't know, Nia and Vivian, if you wanted to add more to that. No, I think we. I think you covered it. I mean, and we do. Um, um, we do have um, some information on that, and for for the next phase. But yeah, in general, that that is the, the the plan. So I just wanted to follow up and clarify. So the the elementary students who whose families choose to be one hundred percent virtual for the whole school year will be associated with a classroom, and. Mm -hmm when the rest of the school comes into phase two, they will remain virtual and connected to that classroom? That is That's, correct. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And, and then you, did, you had a second question that was around how will the families be trained? Um, and so um, Peter Vallejo, who is our uh, teacher on special assignment for instructional technology, he has created um, an hour long module um, to do with families. Um, and that will kick in beginning sometime in July. We are working on dates right now. Um, and then that will continue into um, the school year, especially at the beginning of the school year, because we want to just start off on the right foot with our parents um, having um, some skill set that they've asked for us to help develop. Yep. Well, I want to echo um, Lavender's thanks. Um, this is uh, so many unknowns and so many people have worked so hard to get us where we are and we appreciate that. Um, but one of the things that uh, happens in education is a lot of acronyms. And um, so you helped us with the um, glossary at the beginning because it's really difficult. Um, but I'm wondering if we could have just a very short description of Google Suite and LMS so that we can understand when you're talking about those um, formats that you're going to use, that we know what they mean. The, the, the Google Suite is a really broad term that refers to all of the Google online products, um, specifically for the purposes of what students most, most often interface with, we're talking about Google Classroom, um, which is its own LMS or learning management system, um, though not as robust as a lot of other learning management systems. That's a place in Google Classroom where students can upload work, teachers can provide assignments, uh, it's a space to put on in playlists, which are those lesson plans that are developed asynchronously. Um, there's also the other Google products, Google Docs, where students may be creating material, uh, Gmail, which students can use, obviously, for email and interaction, slides for presentations like the one we're presenting now is on via Google Slides, uh, Google Sheets, and any of the other Google online products. Um, the second part of your question was what a learning management system is. A learning management system is an online platform uh, that's used like what I said for, um, for Google Classroom. It's a space in which information is exchanged between teachers and students, where teachers can load lessons, uh, supplementary materials, uh, video playlists. Um, they can also use those spaces to integrate other tools. So some of the more robust learning management systems have lots of features that have plugins and allow them to attach other software um, and 
I think we'll probably be talking more later in the year about learning management systems as well. Thank you. Sure. Monica, and then I have another question. Um, my question may be premature since you don't know what your model is yet. Um, but have we gotten down um, in terms of what does a classroom look like? Um, and, you know, I had mentioned before to Parveen, can we take videotape a classroom once we have one set up and post it online so parents can see? Um, because parents like me, I would be peeking in the classroom uh, if I still had a student at the high school or in the elementary school. Um, and, and this is real nitpicky, and you may not have gotten to this detail, the, the second question I have. Um, have we gotten down to the detail of things like how do we sanitize the bathrooms and stuff after each use and that kind of thing yet? So um, I'm going to jump in here. So your, your first question is actually coming up next because right now we're talking about just the first part, the virtual part. Um, and there won't be children in the classroom except for the ones that we were talking about and they're not necessarily in the classroom with the teacher. So that comes next after the, the next, the hybrid model. Um, and I think it's a great idea to show people what a classroom looks like. So we're gonna do that um, and share with folks because I think it, it is, um, you know, you want, we will do that. So we're working on that. As far as safety, um, those are things we are still working on. And as I said, there is a lot to figure out with safety. Um, we have been working on it and we definitely are following all the strict guidelines by the health department and we'll share that later. In fact, we have a separate presentation on just those pieces and transportation and child nutrition and things like that. I did I just want to clarify, you mentioned um, that there'll be special supports for intervention for specific students. And, uh, and to clarify, you know, that's our lower socioeconomic class, um, students who have, you know, special, um, need additional supports for various reasons. Could we kind of go over that for the community to understand a little bit more what that means, intervention? Sure, so we know, for example, in the fourth quarter of last year, um, we weren't able um, to provide the professional development and structures beforehand that we typically would. Uh, we also know we serve groups of students that are typically underserved and need additional support to be successful. Um, for example, last year and the year before, we presented on the needs of our McKinney-Vento and our homeless families. Um, so that's an example of one of the groups of students we'd be looking at. Uh, the exact uh, metrics and the groups and how we would determine who would be served um, is still in development, um, but we do know we have limited capacity. However, we want to make sure that we're serving the students with the greatest need uh, from the beginning of the school year. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. appreciate that. Stop. So I'm, I'm still a little bit stuck on the 100% um, virtual elementary part. Um, can you talk about the CVVPE, what, what that is, and just describe it a little bit? So I can. It's jumping a little bit ahead in the in the um, in the presentation because it's in oh, phase okay. two. So I'm I'm I I if I could if, would you mind just holding no, that question? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then when we get thank to that, you. I'll go into detail. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions or comments from the board for phase one, Gary? Well, you know the thing that gets me about all of this is how. What an impossible task it actually is to figure this out. There are no good solutions. We're just looking at the best of a bunch of bad solutions, really. And the one that was really, really keeps coming back to me is, uh, especially with the virtual elementary part, is um, the pressure that this puts on parents at home or whoever's going to be with the child. It's not like a high school kid who can pretty much navigate on his or her own. But I don't know how we solve that. I'm not, I don't know that we can. I just like to say that we recognize that this is a huge problem. Um, 
and I wish we weren't in this situation. But thank you all for all the work that you've done to put this together so far. I appreciate yeah. that. Be before we move on, I I'm actually really, um, thank you, Gary, for um, Trustee Howard for bringing that up. Because I think if you look at the survey as well that we have taken from parents, you will see that the vast majority of our parents are asking to get our children back in school, in person, as soon as possible. And that is why the Senate bill does exactly what it does. Because we know how difficult it is for families and for kids. The learning gap that has been created due to students not being in school in person is tremendous. Again, that's exactly the same reason even the health departments are looking at that. Um, so yes, we acknowledge that. And that's why I, 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 I'm very happy to say that we do have a phase in when we at least, even if it's not full time and if it's not all of the students at the same time because of social distancing that we will bring them back in as soon as we possibly can safely. Thank you. It's back over you, Dr. Ryan. Oh, and you're on mute, I believe. Great, so we're at the next slide now. So then we get into um, phase two. So we just finished talking about phase one. Now we're moving into phase two. We're transitioning into our blended learning models. Um, and again, with the question of what does it look like? Um, next slide. And before we jump right into what the schedule actually looked like, we wanna talk about why we chose AMP, the AMPM model. We get that question. And so we thought we would provide some of the rationale behind it. Um, really, um, one of the things that the elementary team looked at, we looked at all models. We looked at every model that seemed to be out there at the time and available through all the different research. And what we found was our teachers are really, and our students and our families were interested in what's the mo maximum amount of time that we can get with our students. And we found that the AMPM model offered that. It provides the most frequent in-person instruction time with our students across a week's time. It also offers a consistent uh, schedule for our families so that families can um, plan for four days consistently in a row. Um, and it supports our students to be successful, even though it's a more limited time frame on campus, but it still, um, it still allows for in-person and for us to be safe on campus. Um, we follow the CDC guidelines. We're not using the cafeterias um, as a common space for eating or anything like that. Um, we are really worked with our maintenance department um, and our food services um, to provide bagged and boxed meals um, that are using classrooms and, and or then taken home. Um, it also allows for a very robust cleaning session to happen with our, our, our custodial staff um, between, in between the two sets of students coming in. We planned quite um, diligently with, them, uh, with um, Gary and his staff. Um, to make sure that the time that we put in between those two sets of the AM students coming and leaving and the PM students coming, um, that, that we have plenty of time to make sure that every classroom, because I know that's one of the questions, every the questions that have been coming up, um, that every classroom gets cleaned. And then last, um, we have paid really close attention to the physical distancing practices. And we think that with half of the students um, coming in the AM and half of the students coming in the PM three to our classrooms that we will be able to um, hold strong with the physical distancing practices that are safe. Next slide. So what does the phase two elementary AM, AM PM blended learning look like? Um, you're gonna see here some of the similar kind of things that I talked about in the 100% virtual learning version. We have from Monday through Thursday, um, from eight to 11, a three hour block, or from 12.30 to 3.30, another three hour block. Students will come in, um, they'll work with their teacher, there'll be a social emotional check-in, some type of enrichment activity, and directions for the day. Again, we have then a two hour window where teachers are doing the things that they do, when, um, which is with reading language arts and mathematics, whether they're working in small group rotations or with whole group um, English language smarts, there's a two hour block there. Um, our PE teachers are helping um, our general ed teachers so that they're doing some activities, 10 minute uh, window activities to let students have, you know, a little recess time in structured, um, safe um, uh, activities. And we're working on that right now about what it looks like. Um, and then of course, designated ELD time. 
And then that's the, that's the, either the morning time for uh, um, half of our students and then, or the afternoon time. And so whenever those, our students are not on campus, then they're back into their asynchronous learning activities and the specialists kick in, our PE teachers, our science teachers, our music teachers um, will, and, they'll be, and also our students will be completing some of the assignments from their teachers, um, the general ed teachers for ELA and mathematics. That's Monday through Thursday. On Friday, it's a little bit different. What we, um, there will still be a live daily check-in with our students that first thing in the morning um, where uh, teachers are checking in with students. There's a designated ELD time. Um, there's office hours with our parents to ask any questions. And then there's intervention time with our students. But that is happening virtually. And what we thought was, so we have cleaning in between on Monday through Thursday. And then we do a deeper level cleaning um, all, for all day on Friday where it's a virtual day and students are at home and teachers are at home um, and, um, and, and that's able to happen. So we believe that this is um, the best model um, for us to return to school um, when it's safe. And so that's the AM and PM in a nutshell. Next slide. And so um, here is the um, alter alternative uh, learning option, the slide that we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, so for a full year of uh, Valley, uh, Castro Valley Virtual Pathway for Elementary. And again, I will say that this is new for us. We have not had an elementary um, pathway, but who's this option for? It's for students who have or live with someone who has health conditions, uh, for students who have a caretaker that has health conditions, or to families that just, they just say, you know what, I just want 100% remote learning for my child all year long. That's what I feel most comfortable with. That's what I want. Um, so, we, so that's what this option is for. The curriculum to be taught um, is, where, uh, is a mix of our um, adopted curriculum combined with either Edgenuity or Acellus. Those are platforms that have been tried and true with other school districts. Edgenuity is um, what our um, uh, CVVA, CVVA um, uses as their curriculum and they have an elementary version for that. So we're leaning towards Edgenuity right now, but um, we haven't made that final decision. Um, as far as next steps, and maybe this answers some of the board members' questions, um, the elementary, uh, we um, will be putting out um, an application for our families to apply. We're saying that uh, to, to do that by July 20th. So we have a good accounting of how many families we're talking, how many students we're actually talking about. We really need that data. Um, we're gonna survey all of our teachers to determine who will be teaching in this option. Um, there'll be an established criteria. Um, there will be a, a higher a posting and a hiring process for teachers because these teachers are teaching in the virtual pathway all year long. So that is going to be their job um, to um, uh, work with our students who, whose families choose this particular option. Um, and then we also have a lot of work to do um, in regard to once we know how many families, how many students are in are, that their families want them to, how many, uh, what teachers in that interview process then we need to recalculate. It really is a master scheduling kind of thing. So we're put, the teachers that are going to be teaching in our virtual pathway for elementary, they will not be teaching um, in you know, the rest of where the um, AM PM is happening. So there's, that's, that's two separate roles. So I wanna make sure that I'm clear because I'm not sure I was 100% clear before. Um, so hopefully that answers some of the questions, um, but I'm ha um, as we, Esther, we go through the rest of the presentation, um, I'm happy to answer other ones um, when we get to it. I'm going to hand off to um, my colleague, uh, Vivian Parator again, um, to talk about the secondary phase two. Thank you. So in uh, the secondary phase two, in the AB model, um, students will be split into two groups. So group A would go to school physically on Monday and Tuesday and learn asynchronously Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Group B would learn asynchronously at home on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and go to school on Thursday and Friday with Wednesday being the deep cleaning day. Could I have the next slide, please? This is a visual representation um, of the AB model. Um, this is just a sample. You'll notice there aren't any times because the middle school may have different needs from the high school. For example, the middle school has asked to do um, Monday and Tuesday, uh, Monday, first, second and third period and Tuesday, fourth, fifth and sixth period, then um, go to B, first, second, third, 
fourth, fifth, sixth, because they have a block system that they um, pair students together. Um, and so for them, their first, third, fifth doesn't work as well. Um, each school will have their own timings and um, their own um, period length, but they will be approximately the same length. They just may start at different times in the morning. The AB model was the top model pick on the parent survey. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. The second option that we're asking the board to choose between AB and the 10-4 model. Uh, the second option uh, is the 10-4 model. Students are still divided into two groups, group A and group B. Um, group A will go to school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in week one and learn asynchronously um, Friday through the following Friday in um, week two. And group B will learn asynchronously Monday through Friday in week one and then um, go to school Monday through Thursday week two and then Friday again asynchronously. This allows for 10 days away from school between groups. Uh, this is the least preferred model by parents, but does allow for the most time between the cohorts. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So uh, this slide is um, the uh, representation of phase two for secondary for the 10-4 model. This shows you very clearly the, um, the, the modified block, first, third, fifth on Monday, second, fourth, sixth on Tuesday, first, third, fifth on Monday again, second, fourth, sixth on Tuesday. Again, with middle school, this will be first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth on the next day. So this shows you how the students are learning four days in a row, and then they have the 10 days off, and then they come back again to week one. Could I have the next slide, please? So the, here are the similarities and the differences between the 10-4 and the AB model. Um, they both have morning classes in person. They both have physical and virtual instruction. And they both have a free and reduced grab and go lunch. On the off weeks, so for, for week two for group A, they may come through school and do, go and get a, a drive through lunch for our free and reduced lunch students. The differences are that the AB schedule, all the students come to school each week. And in the 10-4 model, half the students come to school each week. The afternoons for both AB and 10-4 are the same in that they will be the activities that they have, a student activities, they will have advisory period, they will have interventions, they will have their counseling, their special ed services, all of those will be done asynchronously in the afternoon with the specialists. Could I have the next slide, please? The alternative option for um, secondary, including middle school, uh, will be CVVA, um, Castro Valley Virtual Academy, which is accredited already, um, and it now will be open to middle school, which it wasn't previously. Families would have to apply to this and go through the intake process, um, as they have been doing. Um, this, this program has been up and running um, in Castro Valley. So um, the classes can be taught um, once a week, they go to school and then meet with a teacher and the rest of the time it's uh, asynchronous learning or online learning with their teacher. Students can be dual enrolled. So if there is a class that CVVA does not offer, a student can take one class or two classes at Castro Valley High School and the rest of their program at CVBA. Could I please have the next slide? So this slide briefly outlines the safety equipment that will be in place before the first day of school. There is going to be a really large board presentation on safety on the 15th. Um, uh, where there will be a lot more details than this. 
Uh, we are following guidelines from the CDC and the County Health Department. Um, and these, uh, the items that you see in our safety toolbox are already at, at the district or being installed um, right now through the summer at different sites. Could I have the next slide, please? Maintenance has worked with custodians to train them in disinfecting and each school will develop a plan specific to their physical plant um, and to account for all of these steps. So every slight site is slightly different and each principal will meet with their safety team and um, come up with their own specific plan. Could I have the next slide, please? Once the plan has been presented to the board and and an option for secondary has been chosen, we will communicate with the staff and families. So schools will develop an action plan for reopening and will communicate that. And we will continue to plan the August PD days, which are very important days. Um, and so there are lots of next steps to go forwards with, which includes a lot of communication with our families and our teachers. Could I have the next slide? Thank you. So now we're opening up for questions from the board. Start, and then I'll go. So it sounds like the virtual option for elementary students, parents have to decide before the school year. So there is there a possibility of switching? Say, you know, we're starting the school year virtually, um, and you know classes are assigned, but then we move into phase two and a family is not comfortable with moving into phase two, do they have the option to then switch to virtual? Um, and then that, that seems to me like it, then they are no longer connected with that classroom they were originally assigned to. They're going to be connected with a different classroom that's all virtual. Mm -hmm. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, so we, we definitely want to be as flexible as we can be. Um, that said, the question is what we can guarantee. Um, so because of it, dependent on how staff are allocated, um, we are hopeful that we would be able to accommodate requests uh, if, if there's a, you know, a severe need or a reason, um, but we cannot guarantee it. So that's why we're presenting it as a 100% virtual full year program, um, because we can't guarantee that there, we wouldn't have moved staff to, to one location or another. That said, uh, we are making every effort uh, to be as flexible as possible. So let me, let me add just a little bit to that because I've seen a lot of questions around that as well. So basically once we, we, we need to know who has those conditions that we described, com com compromised immune system or family members and things like that. And once they tell us, no, I really do need to stay full-time virtual, we need to know that um, in advance so that we can work and find which teachers are going to be doing that. Because the teachers who are going to do the full year virtual aren't going to be also doing the other piece. So we, have to, we are going to have some teachers actually move into that sort of, if you call it, that kind of school. Um, but to your point, which is a really great question because I've heard it from other people. Mm -hmm. Let's say the student is in that program and after the first trimester, they're like, this is really not working and things have shifted and I need to come back. We will make accommodations for them. And we will, like as Dr. Jason uh, Ryman said, we will try to get them back to theirs with the teacher in there. But it's just, we're hoping that it won't be a whole lot of people uh, that we can accommodate. I have a follow-up on that. Um, so it sounds like there's a criteria to qualify for the virtual. It can't, it, just a parent feeling anxiety Let, about this terrible, deadly pandemic is not enough. Let me I'm, I'm glad you're, you asked that question in terms of the secondary program. So that's the current structure for the secondary program. That said, uh, we're in the process of revising that for this context. Um, additionally, uh, you know, we're looking at as we get more students, we're anticipating lots more students potentially taking advantage of CVVA. Uh, what, what 
advantage could that bring in terms of course offerings and potentially offering more courses than we have in the past? Uh, that said, that's part of the reason that we, uh, it's so important that we move. Uh, now, as, as, Dr. as Mr. Amadi, with Superintendent Amadi was sharing before, the more information we have earlier, the earlier we can make that information available for parents um, so that we can share with them, hey, this is the plan that we came up with here, are the options that are available to you. Yeah. Um, and if I could offer just like a, uh, an elementary um, example. So if I am a CVE family or a Marshall family or what, what, whichever elementary school, and my family opts for the 100% remote learning CV, CVVPE program from the very beginning of the year, then I will not be in a classroom at CVE. Like I will not be in with classmates at CVE anymore. I will be with my classmates that have also opt for 100% remote learning. Those will be my classmates and we will have a teacher. So hopefully that helps because um, I know there's a lot of questions around this because it's new for everybody. It's new for us. It's new for um, our community. It's new for our teachers. Um, and so we're, we're going to try to get it right, but um, we're going to need, um, you know, there's more time to work out specific details. But I wanted to give that example at the elementary level because it is so new. Yeah, that, that really does help. I feel like there's a lot of uh, community connections that form. So if you're sort of floating around from virtual space to virtual space, it, it's not, you don't get that. Right. So I see Joe and Gary, but I have one question. Um, I know this is um, very specific, and I know that when we talk about health and safety that we're going to go into the details later, there isn't a mention of cleaning between the A and B. But I just want to verify there will be a cleaning after the B to prepare for the A the next day. Yes. I want to clarify that just to make sure that it wasn't it wasn't explicitly stated. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. And, and to, to add to what you're saying, Lavender, part of the program is there's a cleaning between uh, a deep cleaning between both of them. But there's also between A and A. So but every day custodians will be going through and cleaning the surfaces, et cetera, on the Wednesday. And on the Friday, there would be a deeper cleaning uh, between the cohorts also. And then my second question for now is, I know that we, we will get into the details later, but we will be doing health screenings and cordoning off specific areas that we'll be we're working that out later. But I just want to recognize that there will be some form of health screening um, so that we can protect everybody. So I just want to... State. You don't, don't go into detail. You don't have to because we don't know yet, but just want to yes, no, yes, you know. Yeah, so let me, let me jump in um, there. So yes, we're going to find all that information and share with you, but I think this, uh, you know, people might have heard that every student's temperature will be taken. We are not hearing that that's what schools are going to be required to do or should do, but there will be a lot of requirements and requests of parents and a lot of requirements for us to check at school and for adults. So we'll give you that information later. I did want to say there, one of the questions that kept coming up when I read comments was if I choose the virtual option, um, the all virtual option that we were just talking about, do I lose my space at my school after this is all over? And the answer is no. If you're hearing that from other school districts is because they constantly overload students and we don't do that. We, are, we don't need to do that. So um, I want people to know that our, if you go into the all virtual, you're not gonna lose your space at your school. Thank you. Joe? Well, Pavin just answered my question, my clarification, but I just wanted to also throw out to the folks that are watching that a lot of the requests that we're getting about keeping siblings together or peer groups and yes. those kinds of things, all those things have not yet been determined and we'll do the very best that we can. But I think for those of you that are looking at the 100% virtual and you know your child, of course, when this is the vaccine arrives and we go back to school, your child can go back to their home school with the friends and relationships that they've already built is really important for you to know. So, thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Gary? 
I was just wondering why there was not an AB option for the elementary school in phase two. Could you go over that? So we did, um, the elementary team did look at, we, as I, I, I think I said a little bit earlier, that we looked at pretty much every model that was out there um, available from the research, inclusive of the AB model. But when we looked at the AB model and we looked at the AM model, I mean, a AMPM model, we found that the AMPM model was a better model for elementary students. We felt like, again, back to that kind of rationale page, that it gave us more time um, with our students for direct instruction, which we thought was critically important. Um, it gave us a, the, the ability to give a really consistent schedule so that we thought fam families, yes, it's still challenging, but at least you have four days of consistent students are going to be in school. Um, and it also allowed us to follow the CDC and the um, uh, Alameda County Health Department's uh, regulations around not using cafeterias, staying for a longer period of time with little ones um, throughout the day and trying to serve them lunch. And so it was just, we, we went through and we just did a whole bunch of pros and cons and found way too many cons with the, with the AB model and so many more positives um, with the AMPM model. So we did consider it. Um, actually, we went through it very thoroughly and asked the same set of questions for every model and AMPM came out on top. And, and, and just to add to what Mr. Sisi is saying, there are also different needs of different age for different age groups. And in terms of the amount of time that's spent without contact with the teacher, it's greater for at the secondary level because students are more mature and could potentially handle that. However, the AB model might, the AMPM model might not work at the secondary level because then you're taking three to six classes in a shorter period of time. Uh, conversely, the AMPM model uh, works really well for the elementary students for the, the reasons that Ms. Rashishi shared. Monica? I was just curious, one of the one of the issues that came up with a lot of schools, although I think we handled it pretty well when we shut down in March, was getting kids access to computers and MiFi's, uh, the Wi-Fi systems. Um, when will those be distributed? Will that be done, I guess, for the lower grades? I mean, some of the older levels, the upper levels, may the students may already have um, Chromebooks, but uh, when will the kinders and the TKs get theirs? So th that, um, if you remember a few weeks back, we did a presentation um, about one-to-one -one computing uh, that Mr. Ko um, shared with us. So we are getting all of those computers ready and prepared. Um, so everybody will be able to have that. Um, we did give out MiFi's and we will continue to do that. But one of the reasons that you heard Dr. Ryman and everybody talk about bringing some of our students in is because even when we gave some of our students MiFi, that wasn't enough. We need, some of our students need a space actually to do that work, to make sure their internet is working perfectly. So those kinds of things we will work around and make sure that from day one, whether it be at home or somewhere where on our campus, um, again, not in the classroom necessarily, but we will have with adults and with all of us kind of jumping in and doing whatever it takes that they have the internet, they have the computers, but they also have the space. So yes, everybody will make sure. In fact, I think we're gonna be in much better shape because of the refresh that we did with all of the computers. Mm -hmm. Dot and Gary? So I, I hear what you're saying about the, the need for like regular days in a row with the AM PM model, but I still have real concerns about safety and um, how we ensure that there's adequate ventilation in a classroom so that the PM students aren't getting a higher viral load if there is a viral load than, than the AM students are. How do we make sure that there's enough airflow happening and, and, and the cleaning part? And I know this needs to be worked out um, and, and there will be the presentation on the 15th, but I feel hesitant to approve a plan that where I don't have those kinds of details that really concern me. 
Um, and also, I feel like the AMPM model is that the, it wasn't um, it wasn't the ones that parents chose. And I think it, it's a, a burden on parents to you know go to work for a couple of hours in the morning and then have to drive back and get their student and take them to class for their couple of hours of class and then come back after to pick them up. So it, it feels to me like it's more complicated for parents, even though they can plan that every day, but then that's every day versus having you know that your student will be on campus for this many hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and then you've got that block of time to, um, to, to work if parents need to go to work. So um, right now we're just responding to clarifying questions and then um, your, your comments um, we'll address after all the questions are asked and uh, there's a motion in a second and then we'll discuss what you actually brought up is something that I've, um, you know, that I've heard before as well. So great points, but we'll get back to them. And, and I'm sure at that point, Miss Susie Chan will jump in and, and say a few words about that too. So if there are any other clarifying questions. Gary has one. I thought I saw your hand, Gary. I'm not sure that it qualifies as a clarifying question. I'm not quite sure what that means, but at any rate, I do have a question and it's, uh, are our uh, after school partners working and are they available at this point? And what's, what is our relationship with them in terms of making sure that everything is safe and uh, cleaned up and everything? And uh, because that could mitigate some of the problems that parents might have. Thank you. Ms. Chan can respond to that question. Yes. Um, so we are, we've been working with the, uh, our, our, our uh, child care providers. And so what we've done is actually we've met with them a few times. And so they are, um, they are supportive of, uh, of the district. And so um, what we are um, going to offer is actually instead of just one room that they're currently in right now, um, we are giving them um, additional rooms to expand their program. Uh, they're very limited in the, uh, in the number of kids that they can serve in, the, in a classroom. Uh, I believe it's about 12. Um, and so we're offering additional rooms to, um, to uh, expand their program. And so all three of our providers that are at the, current, at the sites, um, um, they are going to uh, work with us uh, on uh, doing that. Uh -huh. Uh, I also had a question about food in the classroom and eating. That seems really risky. You know, you can't eat with the mask on. Um, is there a, a process that we don't have food in the classroom? I don't know if that's a clarifying question or just a process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, but it, it's, I just went before, before I forget it, I wanted to say it. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And we're gonna have some more, more information on the food piece and child nutrition. Um, next time we're still finishing out um, that process. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's really important. I mean, there's so much training we need to do also with our students, you know, about how they uh, touch and, and eat and all of that stuff. So we'll get you more information on that later. Unless Susie, is there an answer that you have for the food right now? No, okay. Monica? Um, I noticed there was something about uh, limiting parent volunteers, and I totally understand that. But as someone who volunteered a lot when my kids were in elementary school, I'm wondering, and, and knowing how teachers rely on the volunteers to do a lot of the Xeroxing and, and interacting with students who may need a little more support and all that, um, have, have we gotten that far as to how we're going to deal with parent volunteers um, in the classroom? Um, we've been talking about that and we're working on it, but it will be very, very limited. Yes, that's something we want all the time, but this is a pandemic and very unique circumstances. So it won't be as we've had it. In fact, one of the guidance, the, uh, a part of the guidance that we are getting from the health department is actually around that, not allowing visitors and, and really changing all of those systems. Gary? I notice in the secondary AB model, um, 
the afternoons seem to be there won't be anybody on campus is that right i mean or could we extend the time that each group is on campus uh, rather than sending them home Mm -hmm. There will be some people on campus. So we'll be having the clubs, the activities, um, also some interventions with some students who need to stay at, on campus to be able to get help with their work or even just a place to do their work. So there will be, um, and there will be counseling going on. There may be groups, there may be some special ed services. Mo many of them can be performed um, you know, virtually, asynchronously at home. Uh, or synchronously rather, but virtually at home. But some of them cannot. They need to actually be physically present on campus. Dr. Ryman's going to add. Yeah, and just to add to what Ms. Territory is saying, uh, to back to, to um, sorry, to Ms. Theodore's um, question earlier, also one of the considerations is food services and keeping all of the students on campus during lunch rather than being able to release some of the students at that time uh, is an, an additional safe, safety benefit for us. Just want, you know, as we're uh, making sure that groups are not cross-pollinating and that's part of it, you know, the different models, as we're talking, I, I mean, Vivian, I'm sorry, you mentioned um, clubs, like how do we prevent cross-pollination from the different groups with clubs? I mean, I know that's probably too much in detail for today, and I'm sure we'll work it out, but I just, want to yeah that's something we, to think about we haven't gone into detail about clubs but one of the considerations is uh the clubs that can meet virtually then meeting virtually with the club advisor in the afternoon so that way the a and the b group can meet together online since you know it'll be a virtual meeting uh some clubs we we may have to be creative about a little bit thank you So uh, normally around this time, what we usually do when we're in person is we take a short break. And given that um, we have a lot of people on the line, 862 community members, welcome. We appreciate you coming here today. We would like to take, um, we say five minutes or 10 minutes, what works? Five minutes is good. Take a five minute bio break just to grab some water, maybe some sustenance, maybe uh, use the facility. We are going to hold for five minutes and we'll give you, we'll start at, at 8.35 just to give everybody some time to get back. Thank you so much. We'll be right back.
cierto. And for our attendees who are listening in from the public and from our parent groups and our teachers, we appreciate you allowing us to take a short break. Hopefully you got one as well. Um, and we're gonna be starting back up. Um, Superintendent Amadi, are we at the point where public comment can occur? Oh, you're on mute, I can't hear you. Yes, um, yes it is, and we have about 50, 45 people. So if you would like to- Something up really quickly. Okay, so um, given yeah. that we normally have 30 minutes, I would like to suggest that we move it up to approximately an hour and give people about a minute and a half. Um, I wanted to see if the board was okay with that so that we could extend the time and allow for more people to speak. Um, can I see thumbs up from the board? Get consensus? Gary, okay, great. So what we're going to do is we have uh, your hands raised. Um, I'm going to call you um, and you will have a minute and a half on the clock. And just so you know, as you raised your hands, the system put you in line of the order of when you raised your hand. So we're calling you in the order that the hand raise was received. So um, it will be a little bit of time, um, but we really hope you all will um, give us the time to hear all of our community members that would wish to speak tonight. So I'm going to hand it to Dolly Adams. Dolly, are you with us? Hi. Oh, hi. Hey, can well, you we can hear you. Uh, your time will start as soon as you start talking. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> to tell you the truth, I didn't actually raise my hand. I'm in the grocery store now. But I've been listening, of course, to the whole board meeting. And um, I probably have some of the same concerns that uh, some of the other people uh, have here. Um, Really, of course, as a, a teacher myself, I like to see kids in the classroom as much as possible. Um, but on the other hand, um, being 61 myself, I worry about you know being exposed to um, a lot of germs and end up uh, getting COVID-19. I would say that um, since I'm, I mostly have taught secondary, only a little bit of elementary school, um, I would think, at least for the kinds of students I have, uh, seeing the students for shorter periods of time more frequently would probably keep them more engaged. So I believe that would be that AMPM model. Okay? Um, and uh, thank you very much, all of the people who worked on this. I think uh, it shows that you really have been thinking about it. I wish we knew exactly what the plan would be, but. Um, of course, we can't know that because we can't predict the future. Thank you all. Thank you, Dolly Adams. Now, again, I am um, allowing people to speak based on um, the order that I see them. So next, I will call on Sierra Randall, and I'm going to open up for you to speak. Good evening, I'm Sierra Randall and I teach at a special day class for students with mild to moderate disabilities at Stanton Elementary School. With the record breaking numbers of new COVID cases, it frightens me to think of returning to the classroom. As a teacher who experiences students with great needs, I'm gravely concerned about the student safety, staff member safety, my safety and the trickle down effect. My family cares for my 94 year old grandfather. It would be a life or death situation if he were exposed to this deadly virus. There are many other situations where employees or students would then expose high-risk individuals. Is death a risk we are willing to take as a school district? During my three years as a special ed teacher, I've been hit, kicked, spit on, bit, and sent to the hospital twice. Many of these behaviors occur on a daily basis and other students and staff have been injured as well. We do our best to um, work with these challenging behaviors, but district personnel have assured me this is part of the job that comes with being in special ed. This close contact that occurs from these behaviors is a breeding ground for spreading the virus. 
What will happen when these endangering behaviors occur? Who will risk being exposed to help support that student? Masks and social distancing have been proven to help slow the spread of COVID-19. How can we expect our young students to wear masks properly for multiple hours at a time and maintain a safe distance when we have seen adult members of society struggle to do so? What will happen when a student takes their mask off? I could continue to go on about concerns I have about the school district choosing to open up so early, especially as our neighboring districts have chosen a more conservative approach, which includes distance learning for the first trimester and then to revisit a blended program if the data shows it's safe. Sarah, leave... we're at time, so I'm gonna have you wrap up. I'll leave you just with some final questions I'd like you to consider. Will teachers be expected to use their sick time when they're exposed to COVID at the workplace? What is the plan for when a student's family member has COVID or when another teacher or staff member does? We need some more plans. Please re-examine the opening of our schools and I hope that we keep the community in mind when we consider opening our doors. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra. Our next speaker is Sarah Raymond. Sarah, um, we put some time on the clock and we're going to allow you open you up for a minute and a half. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will just say many of the questions that I put on my list of questions over the last few days, thankfully have already been answered, but the biggest ones I have really concern what criteria are going to be uh, followed in making the decision as to what date the uh, phase two will be um, implemented. And you know, with respect to those criteria, are they going to be specific? Are they going to be measurable, attainable, realistic? Are these criteria going to be shared with us before we need to elect a choice to either go with the hybrid model or with the 100% distance learning? I think that this is really critical information to share with us before we make these decisions. Otherwise, we might be running into the same kind of problem that Dot uh, brought up in her question about what happens when it's time to phase into phase two and some parents start thinking, you know, I'm not so comfortable with this. Um, and I, it would be nice to know what the district is gonna be looking at. Um, when campuses are reopened, is there going to be testing given to staff and to students? What happens if someone tests positive, whether the district provides the test or not? Um, another question that's come to my mind is, is lunch optional? For instance, could I pick up my kids before lunch starts? and bring them home so that they don't have to navigate a lunch period. Um, schools such as Van Noy has, has only one custodian. Are they going to have more custodial time um, uh, in order to ensure that this deep cleaning can take place between the AM and the PM cohorts? Thanks very much, that's all. Thank you, Sarah. Right, Sarah, I'm going to mute your phone and I'm going to go next down to the line to Amy Ramos. Amy, I'm going to allow you to speak. And you have, once you're here with us, Amy. I'm Hello, here, Amy. Lavender. We'll start I, your time I, now. All right, thank you. So I just actually want to say uh, I wish every board meeting or PTA meeting had this type of attendance, concern, and participation all the time. We're in very fluid times, and I know. Things are out of control of our leadership and I want to thank um, the district, the board, the teacher teams, and all the parent leaders for all the time and care that they put into the plan. I especially thank uh, Parveen and Dr. Raymond and Nia for the time that just, oh, the amounts of time that have been put in this is amazing. Um, to each of us here and now, um, I think we need to look at it like we're all one big team. I think we all want our kids back to some normalcy and we all want to see that they, they get there as soon as possible. In all my years in the schools, which is 40 plus, I've never seen such a present and compassionate uh, superintendent. And so I thank you, Parveen. Um, I really just wanted to make the comment, it's not a complaint. I totally understand that we all want nothing more than the safety of all our staff, students, and teachers, and to get back to some sort of normal form of school. So there's a lot of unanswered questions. I, I get it, and I think everybody feels the pressure, but how can you answer um, these types of things in this, in this type of uncertainty? So I appreciate all of you for doing the best that you can with the cards that are being dealt, um, the constraints that are out there and all the needs of each individual student. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. Amy, I'm going to mute you your line. And next is Connie. Connie, I'm gonna open up your line. I don't have a last name, so just so you see, I'm gonna allow you to, 
to speak, Connie, and there's a minute and a half. So as soon as you unmute yourself, we will start the clock. Connie, are you there? All right, Connie, I'm, if, I'm going to um, move you back. If you would still like to speak um, and you come back on the line, let us know. Okay. Um, I have next Sarah Fetter. So Sarah Fetter, I'm going to open up the line to you. Sarah, hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, so I understand that there are a lot of details still being worked out as we've kind of all noticed. Um, but July 20th is less than two weeks away. Um, and that's my biggest concern that there are really so many details missing, um, that I would need and probably most people would need before I can make an informed decision about what's best for my children and my family. Um, I honestly have so many more questions than I can possibly ask in one minute, um, uh, but I'll stick to two around logistics. Um, from the proposed schedule of phase one, it looks like all of my kids will be online at the same time and just logistically around devices, internet and all of that. Um, not sure how that's going to work and I'm visualizing me running between a kindergartner, first grader and second grader who are all frustrated with some technical issue. Um, and then the second really is about social emotional learning. If, if I do have to choose the distance learning option for my children due to my own health issues, um, is there going to be some sort of option for children in the dis distance learning cohort that could perhaps match them up with other families and create small bubbles so they do still have some in-person interaction with other children. Um, and that perhaps if the district could um, kind of support that or help navigate that for families in terms of matching people that are interested up and maybe setting some ground rules and structure around it. Um, I know that would help me feel more comfortable with choosing distance learning if I need to, to make sure that my children you know, still get what they need in terms of typical peers. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah, I'm gonna mute your phone and move you off. And uh, next we have, uh, Laura Sepulveda, I'm going to allow you to talk, Laura. Or if you weren't there, it is your turn. There you are, Laura. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Laura Sepulveda. I'm a parent and a teacher, CVTA union rep, CVTA board member. Um, I have a couple of things. First, thank you for all the hard work, everyone involved. My name is listed as one of the people on the secondary team, but um, I only participated in two minutes, uh, I'm sorry, two meetings and not really in the decision-making process. So just wanna be clear there. Um, I wanna to speak to Superintendent Amadi's thing where she said, or statement when she said most families want their students to return to school. As a parent, that's true, but it keeps being overlooked that the second half of that statement was when it's safe. That hasn't been mentioned once. It just kids, families want their kids to return to school. We do, but when it's safe. And we all have different ideas of when that is. Um, to Gary Howard's point earlier with childcare, um, I'm a parent too. And if the district requires me to come to school to do my distance learning teaching, I have to leave my kid home alone. That doesn't feel good. Please allow us teachers to be flexible Last thing I wanna say is in all of the secondary models, there is no provision for cleaning classrooms between classes. So all kids who show up in my class on any given day will come into the same classroom without cleaning. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Laura, I'm gonna move you off. And I will move to Julian Cardona. Julian, I'm opening up the floor to you. We will start, there you are Julian, this is the clock starting. Great, thank you. I am concerned that parents will not have sufficient time to decide on a learning option for their children with the July 20th deadline without knowing all of the safety measures being put into place. It is concerning to hear that temperature checks may not be required. We need to see 
an example of proposed classroom setups and other safety measures being taken at the school before we can appropriately make these decisions for our families. Additionally, uh, or excuse me, additional questions include what is the cleaning plan for in between AM and PM sessions? How will the air be cleaned? How often will uh, the HVAC filters be replaced? Will HVAC be running daily? What method of instruction will students receive if their teacher contracts the virus? Will they have substitutes or will they move to a virtual platform for a 14 day period? Will classes move, um, uh, if, uh, if so, would it be 14 days or longer? Have teacher unions committed to every paid teacher providing real face-to-face -face virtual instruction should they have to move to a virtual platform? Again, there are a lot of questions that we still don't have the answers to. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jillian. I'm going to mute your line and take you off. And I'm going to move on to Maddie Goet. I'm opening you up to talk, Maddie. As soon as you unmute your line, there you are, Maddie. Your time starts now. Thanks. Hi, my name is Maddie Gett. I am a third grade teacher at Chabot Elementary. I'm on the CVTA executive board on the elementary reopening team, and I'm part of the team creating third grade distance learning curriculum playlist for the district. This is my summer break, but I chose to devote this break to creating the best possible learning program for Castro Valley students during a worldwide pandemic. I understand that my job has changed during this global emergency, and I, along with my fellow teachers, are willing to be flexible to ensure our students continue learning. CVUSD teachers have been waiting patiently for guidance and direction regarding reopening schools. The current plan was sent to teachers on Monday, July 6th, but has unfortunately caused a great deal of anxiety and confusion among the teaching staff. As part of the elementary planning team, I was surprised and disappointed by parts of the plan. It is clear that although we were involved in the discussions, teacher input was not considered when making the most impactful decisions, especially around student and teacher well-being. This week, elementary teachers reached out to the CVTA board to voice concerns about this plan, especially around community safety, student screen time, and emotional well-being, just to name a few. If I may speak for teachers, we feel uninformed, unprepared, and undervalued. Unfortunately, the current plan has brought up more concerns than solutions. After reading the reopening plan, CVUSD teachers are stressed. Stressed teachers are not effective teachers and cannot support students through this unprecedented time. Please trust your teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. I'm going to mute you, Maddie, and take you off. I'm going to check on Connie since she's still hanging out there. Um, give her another chance to, to talk. Connie, there you are. I'm going to start your time. Uh, actually, I'm Daniel. I'm the, the spouse. Sorry. Uh, no way. <laughs> she's on that for her using her name. Actually, I'm not. I'm really just commenting concerns that um, we just want our kids to be safe at school. Um, but as of right now, we. Uh, we parents, we are worried that we are kids are young and we don't want them to go to school at this point. We just want the kids to go to school um, using the computer, teaching online. Um, that's the best solution for us because if my kids are worried, get caught in the virus and because I'm only parents that are able to work, if uh, once I start working and we don't able to afford a lot of stuff. So that's the only concern. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to mute your line and take you off. Um, Lisa Caldwell, I'm opening up the line to you. There you are, Lisa. The floor is yours. Hey, good evening. My name is Lisa Calderon. I'm an elementary teacher at Van Ouy. Uh, CVUSD often highlights the partnership between students, teachers, and families as essential to a healthy and thriving educational system. As teachers, for our members in this educational partnership, we have to learn from and apply the experiences of last school year in order to make this upcoming year the best we can for students. This June, I participated in the elementary planning committee to discuss CVUSD's reopening vision and gave my opinion on various scenarios presented by the district. 
These discussions took place with the understanding that we were there to give input on preliminary ideas, which would be further refined with the larger body of teachers through the bargaining process. I'm also a member of this year's CBTA bargaining team. The concepts just presented to the board are still in the process of being considered and adjusted based on further input from teachers. We have had and will have the pleasure of meeting with many teachers from different school sites to hear their accomplishments, difficulties, hopes and concerns about last school year and the one upcoming. It is our way of drawing on our collective experience to create the best educational scenarios and have a voice through discussing and voting, as well as meaningfully contribute to the framework work which we believe will best serve our students. As we discuss the plans presented in this packet and bargain for schools to reopen with the necessary modifications, I'm hopeful that the board will recognize the intent of the input of their teachers. We are educational partners and we work tirelessly to provide the best for students. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate your comments. Um, I'm going to move Lisa off. And I'm going to bring Laura O'Brien in. I thought I did. Oh, no, I brought you too far in, but um, where did she go? Laura, there you are, I see your face. Yeah. <laughs> Please proceed. <laughs> All right, for those who don't know me, I'm Laura O'Brien. I'm a teacher at Castro Valley High School. I also have two students at Castro Valley High School. As a science and CTE teacher, it's really important for my students to have hands-on in-person instruction when it is safe. I miss my students the last quarter of last year and it's hard to teach virtually, but safety is more important. Um, I'm, I share concerns other people did with the models presented tonight. Um, this coronavirus is still new. It is an emerging global pandemic that has not gotten better since March. It's gotten worse. Um, and I'm concerned with things that bring people together unnecessarily, like mandating that teachers during distance learning teach from their classrooms, which might seem like distancing until we all have to go to the bathroom at the same time because the schedule has one together. When we bring people back together for the hybrid model, rather than having a date attached, it would make a lot more sense to have some sort of data attached when cases have reached a certain level, for example. When we do come together, we need to be carefully thought out and planned for physical distancing, PPE, cleaning and sanitizing, and that just has not been done. It's super complicated at the high school, which even when halved is 1,500 students, and we can't do it unless we figured out how to do it safely. Thank you. I totally. Oh, sorry, I'm still on mute. Thank you, Laura. I'm going to mute you off, and she's moved off. Okay. I'm going to call on Todd Finley. Todd, you are open. As soon as you unmute, you will be ready to go. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Todd. Okay, so I'm also concerned about the safety. Uh, you know, I think it calls for robust testing and there is not robust testing in the area right now. And I think it's a mistake to believe that, you know, especially the younger kids and many of the special ed kids are gonna be safe when they're with their mask or with physical distancing. Um, you know, my experience is that, you know, they'll be playing around with it a little bit and it won't uh, be safe in the classroom. Um, you know, I think people have tried to make sure they're safe in other classrooms in Arizona uh, on June 26th. The teacher passed away. Um, the superintendent reports that uh, they followed all the guidelines, but three teachers came down with the virus and they, they one of them passed away. I think we should not succumb to the pressure um, that comes from above to have the classes uh, meet in person. Thanks. 
Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm going to mute Tom. Um, what I'll do is just so everybody sees, I'm going to um, call on the next person, but let the next two people in waiting know so they can get prepared. So um, I'm going to call on David Muller and Rosabel Chang, but afterwards we'll have Sheila Warbass and Karen Cormier. So David and Rosabel, I don't know which one will be speaking. Please. Please proceed. Hi, I'm Rosabel Chang. Um, my husband and I are here. We have a rising fourth and fifth grader at Chippewa Elementary. Um, and our third grader, rising fourth, had the privilege of Mrs. Gett, who I heard speak earlier. Um, I can hear all the emotion in people, and I'm getting emotional myself. We desperately want our kids back in school. And so my only clarification, though, is... Thank you teachers for all of your help. Um, but we are a family who wants our kids back in school. And I would just like to know if masks will be mandatory for everyone. We saw it in the toolbox, but um, we think that's critical and it's become politicized in this country. And I hope that if students go back, please make everybody wear masks because we do think that's important and we do think that's a way to keep everybody hopefully a little bit safer. Other countries have opened up safely because they haven't politicized so many issues and we hope that Castro Valley can do the same because it isn't anymore a global pandemic. It's a pandemic of the Americas. It is not one in Europe or in Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Rosabelle. I'm going to mute your line. Next, we have Sheila Warbase. Sheila, I'm going to open you up. As soon as you unmute, you will be ready to go. There you go, Sheila. Oh, let's reset, Sheila. I don't think we can hear her. Sheila, are you there? I saw you come off mute and then go back on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Well, hello, and thank you for taking my call. I'm a parent with two students in Castro Valley, uh, one entering high school this year and the other in middle school. So Doc closely presented my question, but it wasn't specifically answered. My question to the board is, do we have the option to change from 100% full-time distant learning to the hybrid model once or hopefully a regular schedule, once a vaccine is available, um, or are students locked into a virtual learning throughout the year? So I did hear the students will not lose their place, but if I'm correct, that isn't speaking to students who would want to return to their designated brick and mortar classroom. So this is the second time I've asked this question. Earlier, uh, last week or two weeks ago, I sent it in a, an email to Amy uh, Kyer, and I didn't hear a response. I wonder if the, if the board or maybe Doc could add to that before tonight's meeting is over with. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. I'm going to mute your line and take you off. We have Karen Cormier next and Michael Kuziak following. Karen, your line is open. I thank you for taking my question. I want to thank the board and all the consideration that not only the board, but the special working groups and teachers have undertaken to get us to this point to even start talking about bringing our children back into the classrooms. I know this is a difficult task and that you're working through multiple options, none of which are optimal for any of us um, that are on the phone. I'd like to thank Dot as well, specifically, for asking the difficult questions about the AM and PM schedules that are being considered for the elementary level schedules. I share your concerns and I fear for what happens when there is an exposure due to all the kids being on campus every day um, in this AM PM model. With the kids on campus, there's very little time in between each of these groups to be able to truly sanitize a school. We have one custodian, we have our teachers who are going to be required to do that cleaning, and it leaves our kids with a possible exposure. 
I also have three kids in the district, one at the elementary, one at the middle, and one at the high school level, all of which sounds like are going to be on different schedules, different days of the week, multiple weekly schedules that are changing on a constant basis. What accommodations are going to be made for those families that have kids that have to accommodate all these different schools and all these different schedules on a daily basis? How do we keep it straight as parents? I thank you for your time, and I support our, our teachers' positions on encouraging them to uh, communicate on each of these options that have been put in forth in front of them. Thank you, Karen. Karen, I'm going to mute your line and take you off. Next, we'll have Michael Kuziak, uh, followed by Antoinette Cespin Anderson. Michael, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Good evening. Uh, this is Mike Kuziak. I'm a parent of a, a rising sixth grader at Creekside and a fourth grader at Chabot. It's very reassuring to see you there, Mrs. Perator, this evening. Um, I wanna thank all the hard work. Um, clearly, our, our, our district is taking this task seriously in a very impossible task. Uh, I would just say, as a parent, um, I do prefer the 10-4 model um, when looking at secondary. I think that is a much more manageable thing to do. And two Trustee Theodore's uh, uh, questions. I, I'm concerned about having uh, two cohorts, cohorts a day in our elementary schools if we could at least look at upper elementaries, going into something more of the 10-4 or I think the AB model. Um, I think the problem here is how it's being framed at times. I, I think attaching specific dates to reopening right now is just very premature. And we should really be um, uh, anchoring this in safety and the fact that the county health officer at the end of the day will be letting us know uh, when we'll be moving forward. So I think uh, shifting to just talking, talking about how can we make quality distance learning work for us, uh, making sure that all of us are held accountable, teachers, students, parents, all of us as, as stakeholders are held accountable. I, I really am grateful for Trustee um, Howard's comments about uh, child care. We are in a child care crisis in this country right now. Um, I don't expect CVUSD to solve it. I don't see my teachers as being uh, daycare providers, but I hope CVUSD can help lead a conversation, um, maybe with other local government districts, with the county, with HARD and others, to see how we can solve it uniquely for our students. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to meet your line. Next, we have Antoinette Cespain Anderson, and then Nicole uh, Garibaldi afterwards. Antoinette. Hi there, thanks so much everyone. I just wanted to just, uh, just two points. Um, I think that, you know, what sets our district apart from others is, is parent participation. And I know that, you know, there are, you know, greater decisions that we have to make at this point in terms of what models and what we're gonna decide for our students. But I also really feel that as, um, as a community, we're, we're very blessed to be in, in a position to have so many parents who volunteer, not only on the PTA levels that provide, um, provide other opportunities for students and other things outside of the classroom, but in the classroom as well. Um, and I know that, you know, we're not at that point, but I just hope that we consider um, whether it's, uh, you know, putting more checklists in place and, and things and ensuring that we're doing it safely, ensuring that there's a process for that. But I really, really just wanted to point that out. And again, what makes our, our schools and, and our community um, and our school district so distinct. Um, so we are very lucky and I really hope that that, can, that conversation happens and hopefully if it is within this board's power to allow that to continue, um, I would really, really love, uh, I would really love that. Um, the other thing, uh, a parent mentioned earlier about not having um, kind of the clarification on whether or not we're committing to 100% um, distance learning and then being able to switch. Um, God willing, a vaccine comes in. Are we, are we set uh, to have that distance learning 100% of the time for the remainder of the school year? So if we can, if there can be some clarification of that soon uh, before the 20th, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Antoinette. I'm going to mute your line. Next, we have Nicole, Nicole Garibaldi followed by Bill Taroli. Nicole, I've opened up your line. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, I am a parent of a, a kid, a first grader and a um, going into uh, TK. And my concern was in the fourth quarter um, of this last school year was the pressure that was put on the parents to really put our A game to teach this to teach our kids. And this year having two elementary school 
um, students, I'm concerned about their education and putting my A game at home for them. Um, I do have a gastrointestinal rare disease that has really, um, the stress has really put um, an issue on our family. And so I'm wondering what extra steps is um, the district going to help with parents and the multiple children some families have, especially in the elementary school age. Um, so that's a real concern for me and I really would um, appreciate like, I just want a good education for my kids, whether they have to be at home or they are at school when it's safe. And I just want that to be voiced. Thank you, Nicole. I'm going to mute your line. Next we have Bill Taroli followed by Yvette Santana. Bill, your line is open. Bill, are you there? Oh, sorry. I, oh, sorry, I didn't see the unmute prompt when you said no I was unmuted. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. So I'm Bill Taroli. I have a second grader going to independent next term. A lot to go over all at once in 90 seconds. So I'm going to just write you through this. What happens if this plan doesn't pass tonight? Where are we then? Uh, as far as the online in the beginning, uh, has anybody really considered the impact and time commitment of parents? I know others have commented on this. Some of us work and we're having to play executive assistant in managing classwork and class time with our younger kids. That's a big issue. And I hope somebody's considering that. Uh, are we armed as parents with information to make good decisions about all these things that are coming up for us that we have to decide? And are we really going to be prepared with the tools and changes that are coming? Do we have time to prepare for that in time for school to start? With those of us with SPED kids, um, I've got one who has SCIA, one-on-one -on -one supporting classrooms as part of his IEP. And how's he going to get that in three hours of online training? Uh, how are they going to intervene? Is that really even going to be feasible? How's, you know, are people thinking about these things? Um, another big topic that I wanted to focus on is safety. I know a lot of people are concerned about this. I am too. Um, I, my kid is one that definitely would benefit from being in class, but we need them to be safe. Are masks and distancing going to really be enough for that? Where is the testing? How are people going to feel safer for our kids to be at school? Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I'm going to mute your line. Uh, Shelly, Rhea, you are next, followed by Netta. Shelly, Rhea, are you there? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I am a parent of a soon-to-be kindergartner and a second grader, and I've expressed a lot of the concerns, but I think the one thing that I want to touch on is, you know, we are to working parents on the other hand, and it is nearly impossible to do this. Uh, I don't know how it's gonna work with two kids on virtual classes at the same time. They certainly cannot be by themselves. Like, great, they're on virtual classes, but I still need to be there. I need to be with them. And what happens when my employer is no longer okay and patient with me because I have to be with my kid all day long? Um, the other question I have is, what do we expect to change in a month, right? We've talked about this a lot, which is why are we saying in a month? Why aren't we actually saying, you know, at work we say, you have to have decrease in cases for 14 days before we'll consider moving into phase one at work. So I think we actually need metrics around that. What happens when someone in the class or the teacher gets COVID? Um, the other question I have is what happens when a vaccine comes? Are we gonna require parents, kids, and teachers to have that vaccine when it comes for them to be back in school. And finally, I'd like to know if we've actually thought about outside the box teaching, such as teaching outside, um, where we're not confined to a small classroom. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shelly. I'm going to mute your line. Netta is next, followed by um, Goodman. 
Uh, yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm a CV parent of elementary school kids and uh, I work in healthcare and it's very frustrating for me to hear um, a lot of the comments. I feel like people, a lot of people don't really understand the serious nature of the pandemic that we're going through, that it's not over even though we're all psychologically um, upset about all of this. You know, when, when we see patients for routine exams and I'm in a room with a patient for 20 minutes, we wear two masks, we wear glasses, goggles, a face shield, scrubs, scrub caps, and we have extra special filters in these rooms just because I'm in a room with a patient for 20 minutes. These are patients who are asymptomatic, screened at the front door with a temperature and questions to screen out for COVID. But because of the ramping up of the numbers, our precautions at work are rising exponentially. So I have to agree that phase two can't be based on a date, but it has to be based on community levels of COVID and some other quantifiable number. Um, the other issue I'm concerned about is the AMPM, as Dot mentioned, all those concerns she raised regarding putting safety first. It's not about convenience. At this point, it's not convenient for any of us. None of this is convenient, but we have to think about safety. And you know, some of the other models, like the 10-4, although they might not be ideal, is a lot, you know, better from a public health standpoint. And finally, I wanted to say, um, when we do switch to phase two hybrid, is there any teacher flexibility with in-person versus live? Can a teacher decide to continue virtually if they feel that the students are all moving forward while well, meeting their, you know? benchmarks and no one is suffering from the phase one learning can an individual classroom decide to continue um with their virtual learning and um Nana, we have to let you go because we're oh, past sure. your time but okay. we can take your comments thank you let me get your line we're going to move to goodman next and annie followed oh goodman left annie then um um all in on district 17. Annie, are you there? There you go, Annie. Floor is yours. Hi. Can you hear me? This is Ann. Hi, I'm Ann Panagati. I have students at Independent. Um, I just want to start off by saying that it is incredibly unfortunate that the federal government has not made this a moonshot moment. So I fully understand and appreciate that the plans that are being put forward are being put forward with very limited resources. However, please do not let us adopt something just because of for the fear of having nothing. It's quite obvious that we'll be moving forward with distant learning. So please make sure that the distant learning platforms are equitable between those who might opt into 100% distant learning versus the hybrid model. Because the reality is, I don't believe that anyone's going to be back on campus anytime soon. So when you look, at, especially at the elementary and this whole hybrid, Let's make sure that those who opt into hybrid in the hopes of getting back to campus have the same access to quality programming that those who from the initial gate opt into. Also, I agree with Meta's comments earlier. We really want our kids to school every day, but the reality is that a one week on, one week off split is probably better from a public health standpoint. Let us partner with hard, with Be Best, with AT, with other, the universities who may not bring schools back to have a concept of distant learning camps where those of us who work could potentially pay for other people to supervise the distant learning. Let us be creative in this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I'm gonna meet your line. We have Allen on District 17 and One Plus Seven Pro next. Helen on District 17, are you there? All right, I'm going to mute your line. And move on to one plus seven followed by Jenny. One plus seven pro, are you there? All right, we're going to move on to, oh, 
Jenny, and followed by Shelly Sherman. Jenny, go. There you go. Line is yours. Thank you. Thank you for everybody who's worked on these committees. Um, I have an elementary and a middle school, and my question is looking at the middle school um, schedules, whether it's the 410s or the AB model. And with all the kids rotating classes, um, there's not a core set of classes the way there is um, in elementary. How are they going to clean in between classes? Um, this is um, taking from Laura Sepulveda's question. Um, so, and with Canyon being so large, you're just, it's just a huge bubble. How is that going to work? Um, the second is, what are the criteria for opening the school in terms of the data? And what are the criteria, assuming we can ever open this school year, what are the criteria going to be to have to shut down again? And what is that going to look like for our kids who, who have to go back? And the emotional um, upheaval that's going to have on them from having social to having no social interaction. Um, so those are my questions. And um, the same with the elementary, same. I'm just very curious about the safety, the cleaning, the schedules, are, are there enough janitors? Are the teachers gonna have to do this? Um, how, how are we gonna make it safe? And to the last person who's talked, how are we gonna make sure the equitable hybrid option is just as effective as the online only option? Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I'm gonna mute your line. We have Shelly Sherman next, followed by Holly Powell. There you go, Shelly. Line is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for giving us some time to just share our comments and, and concerns and ask questions. Um, I also want to say thank you to everyone who put in all the time and effort coming up with these plans for the elementary schools and the secondary schools. They seem really clear and comprehensive. Um, I'm a parent at the high school, but I'm also a teacher at the adult school, and it seems there is no plan for the adult school. Um, so that's my concern is, um, is anyone coming up with a plan, working on a plan for a return to the adult school? There are varying needs, the adults with disabilities program, ESL, um, and CTE having very different needs. Um, so I just want to throw that out there and make sure somebody is giving us some thought and working on a plan. And um, as a medical professional, I would love to be included and in putting an input on what that looks like. So um, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly. I'm going to mute your line. Holly is next, followed by uh, Kareen. Holly? Hi, I just have more of a clarification question more than a comment. I'm wondering what phase two will look like for TK students considering they only would go to school for a half day even in a typical school year. That's my only question. Thank you, Holly. Going to mute your line. Next we have Kareen followed by Michelle LaFrenz. Kareem? Hi. Hi. Um, so I am Zoe Lawrence and I am starting at ninth grade at Castro Valley High this year. And I have some concerns about how PE will be instructed because students aren't getting enough exercise as it is. A few of my questions are how will PE be instructed in phase one and two? And will all sports still be offered? And if so, how will they be organized safely? Finally, how many students will be in each classroom? Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Zoe. Your line is gonna be muted. Michelle LaFrenz, you're next, followed by Chris Knott. Michelle, are you there? Michelle, going to move on. Looks like Bethany Chan. And followed by Mike Hernandez. 
Bethany, are you there? There you are, Bethany, the floor is yours. My name is Bethany Chan and I'm a math teacher at Canyon. I'd like to thank those of you on the board who stayed on and are attentively listening during this comment section where parents, staff members, and community members and students are worried about their health and safety. I am offended that the Google form comment card does not have a staff or teacher option. And I'm also concerned that none of these questions from the board have shown any concern for their staff members. All parents are hearing that their students will be able to get into class, but here's what staff is hearing. There is no plan for our safety. There is no plan for testing students and staff members each day for our safety. No plan for what happens if a student or staff member contracts COVID. No guarantee for precautionary materials or cleaning materials. And even if you do say we have those, I'm not sure I believe you because I've been paying out of pocket for my student materials for the six years that I've been teaching. No plan for students to be physically distanced in a classroom and no plan for psychological support when and if a teacher, staff member, or one of their fellow students die. Your board asks questions about daycare, academic content, and even ventilation for students. Nowhere in your questions do you have concern for staff members that are risking their lives and the lives of their families for student education. I double dog dare you to sit in a classroom with 20 rotating seventh grade students and breathe their air. If you cannot answer these questions for the opening plan, if my concerns echo every other member that have commented before me, then these concerns that should be taken into consideration and maybe you should listen to the education experts. We should not be jumping into these models while risking the lives of our staff members. I haven't even touched the fact that hybrid models will double our workload by creating curriculum for distance learning as well as modified in class instruction. And for the first time ever, I am considering con quitting teaching because endangering my family is not something that I am willing to compromise. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback and comment. Going to, oh, sorry, I pushed the wrong button, Bethany. I'm going to, uh, Move to Michelle Friends and then um, over to Mark um, Maladnik, Maladnik. Michelle, are you back and able to talk to us now? Okay. Hello. Oh, you're there. There you go. If we, were, if we were to go to the online teaching, how would we know that the student is, you know, comprehending and then doing the work independently and not, um, you know, cheating or going, you know, doing their work off of the book as opposed to doing their work independently. No. Is that your full comment, Michelle? What's something else? Yes, hold on, one more thing, one more thing. What the, the question was, um, say if our kids, um, we have kids in middle school and also in elementary school, um, if we were to do 100% online, um, how would you know that um, uh, our kids are not getting help doing the exam, doing the test, doing the, um, the, the quiz? How would you grade our kids based on that? Thank you for your comment. I'm going to mute your line and move to Mark next, followed by Nancy Galloway. Mark. Hi there, everybody. Um, my name is Mark Mladenich. I'm the president of the Castro Valley Teachers Association. I am grateful for all the work our staff and management have put into the reopening process under incredible uh, difficult circumstances. And I'd like to thank everyone who has spoken tonight. Uh, this is a great community and it was so nice just hearing the support that uh, the community has for a safe reopening um, and not, not kind of hitching it on to, to just dates, but actual data. Um, there is no substitute for full-time uh, in-person learning. Uh, we wish like everyone here that we could get back to normal, but we cannot. The collective uh, anxiety that we are experiencing is from the unknown. The number of cases is growing in the Bay Area. Current research from the World Health Organization does not lend well for gathering in indoor spaces. Um, as Mr. Finley had mentioned, three teachers in Arizona who were following protocols taught in the same classroom contacted uh, COVID-19 and one died from the disease two weeks ago. Uh, these are the realities that we are facing as we go forward uh, to back to uh, in-person learning. I think the best thing we can all do is be willing to adjust and compromise 
and to set realistic expectations as this pandemic evolves, but to never compromise on the safety of our children and staff. Our union will continue to work with district management on a safe opening, and if that means we need to adjust even the proposed schedules that you vote on tonight, we will. Many of the educators in Castro Valley are also parents who send their children to our schools. We want what is best for our children, whether they are students or, or, uh, or our, our students or our own children. And when we reopen, we want to make sure that we have every safeguard to protect our community from this horrid virus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to mute your line. Next, we have Nancy Galway followed by Murray. Nancy, are you here? Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Galloway, and yes, I am back. The situation is new, but the struggle is exactly the same. Please let me work harder. I teach elementary PE, and my schedule when school starts calls for my teaching time to be limited to two 20-minute Zoom meetings per week. Okay, I thought, I'll push out a digital lesson that the students can work on with their families, and the meetings will be used to clarify, affirm, or refocus so that the material from the standard is actually learned. I was told that I was not to use digital lessons because I didn't want to overload the students. So the impression is given that the important subjects get time to learn, but in PE, learning doesn't matter. And close your eyes for a second and think about 26, oh, sorry, 25 six-year-old children staring at you from a computer screen. Without being able to send materials home for practice and practical application, they will retain very little of the material. Also, when the hybrid model begins in September, the schedule calls for my PE activity time to be in 10 minute blocks. That puts me with student contact numbers that are in the 300 plus range for the day. And it is not recommended by any guidelines from CDC, state, or the county. I think about, and think about the contact tracing nightmare if I do get infected. And lastly, research warns that children who possess inadequate motor skills are often relegated to a life of exclusion from the organized and free play experiences of their peers and subsequently to a lifetime of inactivity because of their frustrations and early movement behavior. I want to work harder and better. I know how to do that. The district needs to stop putting roadblocks to stop me. Thank you, Nancy. I'm going to mute your line. Next, we have Murray followed by uh, Jesse Beck. Murray, are you with us? There you are, Murray. Um, I want to echo the, the sentiment of most people that we don't have enough information to make a decision on what type of education would be best for our family. I currently have six kids, um, two in middle school, one uh, entering fourth grade, one going to TK, and then two, a preschooler who will not be in the school, and a two-month-old. The idea of trying to um, get assignments for virtual learning and then teach it seems overwhelming to do for four students while managing two little ones. But at the same time, I don't have enough information to understand if remote learning would be a good fit for my family either. I want to know if students can, um, if we choose the remote learning option, could students also participate in sports, groups, or web leadership activities that the Creekside Middle School would offer or other schools would offer. Also is the, um, if they complete in understanding that the asynchronous learning um, in the remote learning option, if they finish their grade level work, since they can do it at their own pace, would they then begin the next year's work or are they just finished for the year? How would that work? Also in phase two for the virtual school, who is providing the instruction? Is it a live video for the class or is it teacher led? It would be wonderful to know if um, the elementary school and the secondary schedules could be at the same time, having both the 1040 or the AB option rather than the AM PM, limiting the teachers exposure as well as the students. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'm gonna mute your line. Next, we have Jesse Bick followed by Rebecca stanek Rykoff. Jesse, are you there? Yes, hi, can you hear me okay? Yep, floor is yours. Hi, this is Jesse and Kristen Bick. We are uh, parents at Stanton Elementary. Uh, I, com I commend you all for your efforts to provide these options to us in short order. Um, I personally, personally believe that continuing the lives of each of our community members comes first, and allowing our community members to gather in person comes second. 
our next door neighbor right here in Castro Valley passed away from COVID in March of this year. So we've experienced firsthand the ripple effect of a life ending prematurely. And folks should consider how that scenario would play out in a youth setting. It's beyond heartbreaking. Uh, so for one thing, we echo the request to tie phase two commencement to scientific data. With that said, there have already been a lot of logistic, uh, logistical questions and comments from the other folks on the call. So I'll ask a question that might become critical a few months down the road, maybe uh, for the treasurer to consider and maybe you already know the answer. If the available budget for the school district is not able to adequately support the school year's costs with all this new stuff, what is the most likely primary funding option available that would allow schools to continue to function in some capacity? Are we looking at federal support, local taxes, cutting some of these programs that we've been talking about all night? That's my question, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. I'm gonna mute your line. Next, we have Rebecca Senek Rikoff, followed by uh, Tachi Kalas. Rebecca? All right, uh, I think I'm unmuted now, thank you. Um, I'm a parent of two students who are going into second and fifth grade this fall. Um, and I have to say, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the lack of detail combined with the high degree of certainty from the district so far and some of the planning. Um, that seems a little backwards uh, considering where we are in this current pandemic. Um, some of the questions I have that I feel as an elementary parent I need to have an answer to before July 20th um, include, you know, is, is there's, there seems to be a lot of political pressure on schools to get back into the classroom as soon as possible. And given the existence of all this political pressure, is Alameda County public health um, officials, are they truly the only decision maker or does the district have the power to say, even if Alameda County Public Health says you're good to go back to school, does the district have numbers and guidelines that they will be using to say, no, actually, it's not safe enough for us, even though the, even though the county has given us a go ahead, you know, maybe our effective is too high and we're not comfortable with this. I, I would like to know what those numbers are that the district is considering um, in their guidelines. Um, secondly, when we get to, if we ever get to a hybrid model, because I don't think we're going to get there September 14th, um, I just really want to wonder if you're considering doing what Berkeley Unified is doing, which is really having those students outside as much as possible, which is probably the biggest thing you could do to decrease the risk to teachers um, and students by having students outside with masks, you know, for basically the whole school day. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm going to mute your line. I just want to, um, okay. We'll have Tachi followed by Don. Hello, this is Tachi Callis. I'm a parent with a, with a fifth grader and a, a eighth grader starting at Lenoy and Canyon. I'd like to thank the group for the hard work that's gone into this. It, it really is a difficult situation. So thank you for your efforts. Um, I, I would really like to put out there that the AM PM schedule for elementary is just really, really difficult for, for any family that doesn't have a dedicated stay at home parent. Um, please, please mo consider moving that to, to a 10 4 schedule. That, that really is the only socially responsible option for, for getting kids back to school when it is safe to do so. Um, I, I would also like to echo the concern about the, the secondary school period system. Uh, kids moving back and forth and intermixing with insufficient time for cleaning, that, that is really problematic. Uh, so please think, think through a better solution there. Maybe it's a fixed group of students and the teachers move around. Um, maybe there are some other solutions that work. Um, with reduced schooling, please focus on the three R's. And um, again, thank you for your efforts here. Thank you, Tachi. Meet your line. Don. Don Myers, are you there? Floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. I'm just, I am humbled and amazed at that the community has really come in to share their concerns and thoughts and support. This is pretty amazing process. Um, I am scared. 
that July 20th is coming up soon. And I really hope with all these comments that have come in that the Alme Alameda County Health Department can provide the much needed metrics and data that is needed to say when it's safe to open. I understand that the board needed to put something out there, but it has caused unfortunately a more fear than reassurances. We need those metrics to understand how and when it is safe to open. And also I hope that in this report, there is commitment made that if we are lucky enough to get a vaccine this year, that that will be part of this plan that is put out for all the teachers, staff, parents, students to commit to our safety. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, Don. I'm gonna mute your line. Now uh, we've hit our 60 minute um, time for public comment. I wanted to see if the board would be willing to extend another 10 minutes to allow for more speakers. Just give thumbs up for those. Great, okay. Um, I have a phone number, <laughs> so I'm gonna call you out. Uh, 834-115-28350. I'm going to ask you to unmute your line. Are you there? Okay, we will move to the next public comment. I have a Catherine Pye followed by Regina Abanas. Catherine, floor yours. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I have two children. Uh, one is entering kindergarten and one is entering second grade at Van Noy. And um, I was concerned about, um, we're interested in the virtual learning for the entire year, but I, I do have concerns about the amount of screen time that's going to be required. Um, I know for older kids, online learning and being in front of a screen might be a little bit more feasible, but it's gonna be really hard for little kids to sit still and then also the screen time. Um, and so uh, I am i don't work full time. And so I was interested in being more hands-on with their schooling um, to help lessen that screen time. So I wanted to find out if um, parents who are in that situation will be given a little bit more freedom maybe to teach some of the lesson plans themselves um, but still checking in with the teacher and limiting the screen time for the children. Thank you, Catherine. I'm gonna mute your line. Uh, Regina Ibanez followed by Paula. All right, Regina did, oh. oh, and she moved. There you go. Regina, are you there? Sorry. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so first of all, um, I wanna thank everybody who's worked on, you know, just all the plans. You know, I know it takes a lot of work and I think like one of the things that like about COVID, it's that we don't really know a lot about it. You know, as a health coworker, I see it every day. You know, when I go to work, I feel like every day all of a sudden we're given like new, like, okay, today you wear a mask. Okay, now you have to wear a face shield. And, you know, so I feel like, you know, I understand that it's hard and we have to be flexible and there's a lot of things that are unknown. But one thing is just like, I worry about like safety, not just for like, you know, the kids, but also like about the teachers. I think like when I, I recognize that like a &PM, the schedule is really hard for like health care parents who don't have the flexibility of, okay, my kid's off at 11, I'm going to come and pick him up. Like, especially for myself, like I live, I work across the peninsula. So like, you know, it's really hard to just, okay, I'm going to leave work. Another thing is just, you know, and I'm just like the teacher separating two groups, you know, the teacher is going to be the contact point, I feel like, right? In the morning, they're going to be with this student. Okay, they're going to deep clean, but what is the teacher going to do in between that? you know, and then the second group comes, you know, that's just very worrisome for me. Um, the other thing I guess is just about virtual learning is just, you know, it's really hard to teach the kids, like, especially, you know, when you're working and then trying to figure out how to teach, you know, the material to the kids, I think it would be really helpful if we got access to teacher content, if we could be, have like a, a link or something where we can go in and learn what we're supposed to help our kids with, especially with just virtual learning in general. 
Thank you, Regina. Timer? Yes, that was the timer. Thank you, Regina. I'm going to meet your line. And I'm moving on to Paul, followed by Julia Runkel next. Paul, are you there? Yeah, hello. Hello. Yes. Hi, this is actually Regina Moore with Paul. Um, we have, we're parents of a child who goes to CVE and I just wanted to say first, you know, thank you to all you guys who put in the hard work to do all this research, come up with all these plans. I know you guys are just at the start of all the work that needs to be done. So I applaud you for what you guys have done up until now and listening to all these comments and even doing overtime. We really appreciate all that work you guys are putting in. Um, I do want to kind of add to the voices saying, you know, like stressing safety. Obviously, that's kind of be the paramount, not only for the kids, but the teachers and for the community. So I really want to emphasize that that is kind of put on the forefront as far as the information that we get, as far as what kind of metrics you guys are looking at for when schools can be open safely and even still what metrics you're going to be watching for schools have to close down because the way it happened last time was such of like, oh, it's only going to be a couple of weeks and then boom, rest of the year. It was such a shock the way it happened. If we could be a little bit clearer on the communication. Just to get us prepared. Yeah, uh, kind of what's coming up so we know, okay, numbers are rising, prepare yourself. Um, also, you know, the information that we'll need to make the decisions, I think in, with a lot of comments that were made, like if we do go with the online virtual option, one, if we can get some introduction to that before we have to make that choice. Two, if we sign up into that, if we don't like it, can we switch back and have a place available in the classroom? Um, also for the classroom option, um, a little bit more information again about the safety measures that will be going on as far as distancing and protocols for cleaning. And also as a military, I would see the 10-4 option put back on the plate, but I know it's a little late in the game. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you all, or both of you. I'm going to mute your line and go to Julia Wrinkle. Julia? Hey. Yes. You can hear me? Okay, great. Um, hello, my name is Julia Beth Runkle. I'm the third through fifth grade SDC teacher at Stanton. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for all the time and effort um, CVSD has put into the preparation for the upcoming school year. I know this is a daunting task and I do not envy your position. There are many cases of COVID now, more than there have ever been in Alameda County, more than even when we started shelter in place. Anyone can become devastatingly ill from COVID-19 and students who are medically compromised are at an increased risk for developing a severe case of the virus, as well as teachers. I know that the decision to send students in the special day class first comes back from a place of well-being and concern from the students that are in the most need of one-on-one -on -one in person instruction. In all my time at Castro Valley, I have felt an overwhelming amount of care, love and support for the students in the special education program. However, I have to ask if it is not safe for general education students to return to school, why would we send back the students in the special day classrooms, some of which have severely compromised immune systems? From my understanding of the proposed plan, students in the STC classes are returning to school immediately for in-person instruction, while the gen ed population is being protected through virtual learning. By returning to school immediately, STC students and teachers are exposed to the potentially deadly virus for an extra month of in-person time. Also, what does this school day look like for special day classes? Will they be following an AM PM model or will we be together all day? These are important things to keep in mind. Um, I want to share that the teachers, we do not want an easy way out. This is hard. We would much rather be in person with our kids. And I just hope that we can make choices that are the best for the students and the students. So that Thank you, Julia. I'm going to meet your line. We're going to move to one more comment from Tierney. Tierney, are you on the line? Available? Yes, hello. Hello, floor is yours. Um, so, hello, I'm dead. <laughs> hello, my name is Tierney Fries, and I'm going into seventh grade at Canyon Middle School, and a couple of questions that I have are, one, would we be having masks, and would we be picking up our lunches and leaving, or would be, or would we be leaving before lunch? Those are my only questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And it looks like we are um, done with the period for our public commenting. I wanted to thank everyone for their comments and I will be moving it um, back to 
Harveen, am I moving it back to you to say a few words before we take a vote? Uh, and you're on mute. I would like to, um, I know um, before you start discussing, there, um, you know, there will be a motion in a second, but I just wanted to respond to, to some of the things that came up because I know those are questions you probably want to know. But I want to go back to, um, you know, there's a lot of conversation about why in person. If you go back to the beginning of our presentation, Senate Bill 98 and the Budget Act was passed based on that assumption that we have to get kids back to school as soon as possible when safe, when the health department says you can. So now I'm looking at the health department guidelines and I'm reading directly from them. Again, we had a meeting today again. And it, 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 it's written in their guidelines. It is our firm belief based on evidence about the impact of COVID-19 in children and adolescents that our children are best served by return to some level of in-person instruction hybrid at the beginning of the 2021 school year that balances optimal learning and student well-being and measures that address the safety of our school community. Now, they've also given us a whole lot of things to make sure that we are keeping everyone safe, which we have to follow, and we will work with the health department on. So when folks are asking what's the make, they've already told us why, and I'll read, I don't want to take too much time, but this is from Santa Clara. Why is it that they feel it's important for students to be back in school um, in light of all of the things that we heard, and I agree with that, how dangerous it is. They're saying COVID-19 disease prevalence among children is lower than in adults. Now I'm not a doctor, I'm getting this from the doctors. And, and children who contact, contract COVID-19 are more likely than adults to be asymptomatic or to have mild symptoms. And then they go into some other details. Furthermore, in several studies, children were less likely to be the first case within a household. I mean, they've got reasons scientifically that they have used to tell us those things. So we actually, based on all of those, we should be starting school, in-person instruction, but we have asked and said, we, in order to be ready, because what we're thinking is, if we start in-class instruction in November, in December, in January, or in March, we may be back where we were this year, and we're gonna be back to full-time distance learning. So our teams that worked, our planning teams, which also included teachers, and administrators said, please allow us to have a few weeks of uh, virtual learning and teaching so that we can set the stage, we can get all this done, and then we know how to go back to it when we do need to, and we have time to figure out all of the pieces we need to in order to bring children back in. So that's why you see the kind of plan that you see. Now, I think there's a lot of discussion to be had about the different models. And I know you have a lot of questions and we heard a lot of great comments from community members. So I wanted to say those things. And in addition, there are screeners that the health department is actually working on. I know Nick McMaster might be online and I'm gonna call on him in just a minute to give us some feedback about that safety piece and the, screen, um, and the screeners uh, that, um, that they're working on. Uh, but there are lots of details to be worked out. All the safety issues that I heard tonight are things that we have either looked at or are looking at that, that we will have to discuss and bring back to the board, not whether we're gonna do them or not. We, we just have to show, tell you all of the things that we must put in place. There were a lot of uh, comments. I think there were some comments that, um, Perhaps uh, I didn't make real clear when we were speaking at first. Uh, one question was, 
can it, if we are on the hybrid model or the virtual model, can we go back when things are back to normal? Absolutely. We also um, have said that at the trimester, for people who are in the all virtual, could switch. It was just, we can't have, we are hoping not everybody will do that because we now have teachers who are teaching that group of students. So yes, all of those things are possible. I heard a couple of times teachers are going to be cleaning and wiping. That's not what's happening. Um, and I know that Susie Chan can say more about that. Um, and we'll get to it. Um, there's just a lot. I wrote a lot of things down, so I will um, just add as we move forward. But there was another question that kept coming up, and I've seen it, and I've heard it, and I think it's a great question. I want you to know that when we talk about the cohorts of teachers who are coming back for hybrid, we're not going to just say five students here, 10 students here, without looking at the family dynamics, without looking at the cohorts of teachers, without actually pulling data and seeing who has several children in what grades um, and which cohorts they will be in. So that's a really important part of the job. And that's why we need a lot of time to do all of these things so that we can put it in place so that it meets the, as, as best as we can the needs of our families and teachers. And when I, I really wanna thank Mark um, our union president for his comments. Um, we have worked very well together. The plan, when the plan, when a plan is approved, we work on the impact of it and the effect of it through memorandums of understanding. And we want to make sure our teachers are safe. We want to make sure they have absolutely everything they need and our students are safe and have absolutely have everything they need. So I'll stop there. If you want to go ahead and move and and into discussion, and as you start, if you would like to ask some questions for staff to jump in and speak to, that's great. And Nick is now here, and he can jump in later. Just um, let's wait for the next piece, and then we'll have you speak. Thank you. This is an action item. Joe? So, Lavender, how would you like us to address this? Do you want to put the motion on the floor in pieces and do elementary and, and a preferred plan or sec? I'm happy to help you move it forward. I just don't know how you'd like it to be. Um, I was planning on it going all at one because it's one agenda item, but it looks like that there were a lot of comments that separate things out and I see a shaking head from Gary. So um, looks like we will separate them out. Um, elementary versus secondary. So if we could start with elementary. Joe. So again, I'm putting a motion on the floor for discussion. And the motion will be that we adopt the AM PM schedule for the hybrid learning and the virtual learning for the first part of the school year for elementary. Thank you, Joe. The motion's been moved. Is there a second? I'll second it so we can discuss it. All right, the motion's been moved and seconded. Um, open it up for discussion. And then I have a comment. I, thought I called on you. Sorry, I didn't hear you say my name. Um, so the, the safety concern is a big one. Um, and I'm glad we're going to be following um, the county public health recommendations. Um, but I have concern that that's going to be, that's pressured by um, other things. Um, so I think when that time comes to transition, we need to talk about that. But since 
right now we're talking about approving the um, AMPM. Um, I don't think this is the best way to serve our community. Um, the, the lack of time to clean between the AM, PM, the, the potential for teachers to be exposed to um, a whole classroom of students every day or for four days in a row. I, I don't think that's the safest thing to do for teachers. Um, when my kids were little, every time they caught a cold at school, I got sick every single time. So even if kids aren't um, symptomatic or they're slightly symptomatic, they're going to bring that home to their families um, and, and to their teacher. Um, so I think we need to rethink the, the model for elementary. Um, I had a comment, Gary, and then Joe. Um, I just wanted to say, um, when we're thinking about this, because I know that safety is a central theme, um, I, I want everybody to, 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 to just be on the same page about that we're not going back if things get worse. We're not going back if the county doesn't allow us. And, and, and safety and science will be used and utilized to ensure that that is what takes place. So, I just want to make that clear for our families and our, our teachers. Safety is number one. And so I know that a lot of people don't feel that um, based on some of the comments, but I want to make sure that that's what we're going to be doing. And, and I'd like to respond to that. Of course, safety is the, the first thing. I mean, that was on the first slide is that, you know, the, the first thing that we're thinking about is safety, but nothing is going to change between today and September 14th and or November 14th or even March 14th. We aren't going to have a vaccine this school year. Um, so I think putting, e even if um, the rates of infection go down and the rates of hospitalizations go down and testing is widespread and barrier free and, um, and there's adequate contact tracing, um, there is no risk free um, way to do this. So I think we really have to think hard about how to reduce that risk in the timing of bringing students together and the number of students we're exposing our teachers to every day. Of course. Gary. Well, there, it, right now, there is no other option here. This is been presented more or less as a take it or leave it. Um, so that does give me some concern. I still like the idea of an AB as opposed to an AMPM. Um, is this the only option that we have? That's one thing. And the second thing was, I would, if it's possible to erase the September 14th date, I think it would be very helpful to just say we're not using that date at all anymore. Thank you. Parveen, to respond? Okay, so, so um, yeah, two things. Again, September 14th was a date because it's about five weeks. Right now, when people ask, when is it safe to go back? We're hearing from the County Health Department. It's now, but we are just saying, let's extend it. So maybe it's not September 14th, maybe it's September 20th. But at that point, if things stay the same as they are right now, as bad as they are, they're telling us you can go back. If things get really, really awful, they will say you can't go back at all. So we have to listen to them. Today, we actually asked, like, when would it be that you would tell us we have to go back to all distance learning, no question, everything has to be shut down. She said, they actually, three doctors there said, it has to be extremely, extremely bad for us to do that because the cost of not having children in school has been too high. And based on all of the things that they have seen, it, the, the um, impact of having them in school, they have weighed all of that. And, and again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not saying that. So September 14th is not, 
it doesn't have to be the exact date, but it has to be around that time so that we have enough time to do some hybrid in case we have to go back and forth, we can do it. And then we can say to the state, we actually are having a plan to come and bring our children back. Again, based on SB 98. I also want to say, I know that there were a lot of people who said July 20th is too fast for them to tell us about the virtual. I think we'll be okay with extending that a little bit and giving people a little bit more time because, and the only reason we were thinking that is once we know that, then, then Sherry and, and HR, Dr. Beats can work on which teachers, right, are going to be teaching that all virtual and aren't, don't need, won't be coming back into the regular classroom and things like that. So it's just a little bit of time for us to plan that. Now, I don't see a problem if we move that to probably like June 25th or 26th or something like that. I can't even remember if June, June 25th might be, I don't know what day of the week it is. Saturday. <laughs> is it what? Saturday. Yeah, so maybe the Monday after that. Um, that's not a problem. And, and again, I want to reiterate, whoever chooses that option, and that's why to uh, Trustee Theodore's point about things aren't going to change a whole heck of a lot for a while until we have a vaccine. And that's why we knew that there were families that were compromised health-wise. They had uh, older family members or were really worried about coming back. And that's why we put together the virtual, all virtual. Also giving them an option that if it doesn't work after the first trimester, we'll try to move them back. In. So, and, and, and Trustee Howard, it's not, uh, I mean, that's the option they have worked on that, that they felt in, in uh, Ms. Rishichi and Mrs. Peritor and Dr. Ryman can say some more, but that's what the, the group that worked on it preferred. But you as a board can, can, can tell us there are different options, especially since the high school is different and middle school is different. Um, if that's you know, a decision that we need to do, we'll, we would go back and just figure that part out. But at least then we know which model and we can actually work on it and, and possibly make it happen. I don't know if any of you guys can jump in and say a little bit more. <laughs> Yeah, just, just to add to what uh, Superintendent Amadi was sharing earlier, uh, time is of the essence. We have five weeks until the beginning of the school year. Um, and so when I hear the concerns, especially around safety, around the details of planning, uh, in order to get to the level of detail that we'd like to be at, uh, we really need to have the structure in place so that we can talk with our maintenance operations and facilities folks and develop those plans so that we can work with teachers and HR and make sure we have personnel in the right locations. Um, so the, the, the one piece that I would just add to what um, Superintendent Amadi is saying is that uh, giving us the support of letting us, giving us clarity in terms of what structures we have at this point allows us to start that detailed planning work now uh, so that we can have the best plan and the safest schools for our students, for our staff, and everybody um, possible. Joe, and then Monica her, had her hand up. Well, we started this evening with a conversation about safety and safety being our first priority. So I think a lot of the concerns that folks have we're aware of and we know that they need to be addressed and we're going to be responsible stewards of their children and staff health. Um, and we'll do that along with the guidance of the county health officers. But I see our responsibility tonight is to figure out high quality learning and teaching. And what we're being asked, and Jason kind of said it for me, but what I was thinking is we're being asked to provide the skeleton of what it's going to look like so the staff can figure out where they're going to go. And I think I really want to honor the work that the teachers and the administrators did to bring this to us because I'm not an educator and I'm not the one that recognizes um, the impact of what's going on with the students. But I know that I feel like there's been a tremendous learning gap 
since March to now. And I think we need to do everything we can to not only close that gap, but to give students the highest quality education we can for next year. And um, so I'm sitting here at my desk. I have the school opening planning group that Parveen was on from AXA. I have the uncertain road ahead from CSBA. And I have the COVID-19 school guidance from Alameda County Office of Education and the health department. I've read all of them. I've listened to dozens of seminars and workshops on this. And I truly believe that it's our obligation to give the staff the skeleton that they need to build. And I, it, it pains my heart that we can't make this work for everybody. I completely understand that this is really probably not going to work for anyone perfectly. And that absolutely sucks. And I mean the families, the students and the staff. But given the number of unknowns out there and what we need to do is figure out how to give the best high quality education and teaching that we can. So I'm going to advocate that we move forward with the recommendation from the staff. Monica, you had a comment, question? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think we're kind of doing this backwards, but it's probably the way it had to be because you can't really define all the safety criteria or safety mechanisms you're going to put in place if you don't know what your plan is. But I think it would be, I think parent, as, as a parent and as someone who recently had a child in Castro Valley Schools, I know I would feel better if I knew more about the safety, um, safety uh, mechanisms that are going to be put in place. But I, I appreciate you can't really define those until you know what your educational model is going to be. So, but I, you know, I, I took notes while in, you know, on two pages of notes and I know safety was a reoccurring theme. So I think the sooner we can um, come up with a plan and then define the safety that, uh, mechanisms that are going to be in place for students, the more comfortable parents will be about sending their children to school. And also, um, it was also a theme about that July 20th date. Um, people don't even know what we're going to do, what the plan is. I think we definitely should move that back and give people more time. So I have a comment, but Parveen wants to respond and then I'll hand it over to Joe after I'm done. I was actually at some point, I would like uh, to call on Ms. Chan and then Mr. McMaster to say a couple of words about safety. But I want to say, if we came to you and said, this is our safety plan for this plan, I guarantee you there would be hundreds of holes <laughs> because what we have to tell you is we have to have all the safety precautions in place. That is a requirement by the health department for us to have. So regardless of what plan we have, we are gonna then, like uh, Trustee Lee said, we're gonna work on all those safety issues within that skeleton that, uh, that Ms. Loss was talking about. So whenever you feel it's the best time for Ms. Chan to maybe say a few words about safety and Nick McMaster to talk about a couple of things. Let me get my comment and Joe's comment and then we can move over to them. Um, I do wanna, you know, uh, re-ask the question. I know that it's been explained. I, you know, we've, we've had a lot of comments from public comment that maybe they weren't there in the beginning. And I know that there was a lot of uh, comment from teachers around the elementary model. Um, and, and can you explain to us why not the 10-4 for elementary again? So we can kind of rehear that or, or a different model of some sort. Why not mm -hmm. something else versus um, the MPM? Um, so what I, what I would say is that when we talked about all the models, we did, we talked about and went through the same amount of questions like what are the pros, what are the cons of each of these models and, and spent hours doing that. The 10-4 model was actually the least favorite choice of the elementary team. Um, they didn't, they thought that um, the way that it was structured, that it was an economic model versus being a really um, instructional model um, based on if the 
um, um, education system is working directly with the business system and that that moves together um, on, on the same on, on the same calendar. And so what they said was with younger kids, every day it was going to be like Groundhog Day every I mean, not every day, but every time students came back to school, we were going to have to reteach and redo everything again because of this amount of time that was in between students being on campus. Now, with older kids, that might not be the same case, but with the, take, the, the TK through fifth grade, they really thought that that, that model just did not work. Um, the AMPM model was the model that um, at, came to the top. Um, every time we talked, we talked AB as well. We talked, and it just came to the top every time when teachers were thinking, what's the best um, instructional model that I'm going to be able to connect with my kids the most from a social emotional perspective. I'm going to have the time to really go more in depth um, from a content perspective in English language arts and mathematics. Um, the, out, the amount of hours that I'll be able to spend with my time having direct live instruction um, and um, at, at versus what happens with the AB or even with a 10-4. They just saw that as a, as a, as a, um, uh, a better model. Um, you know, there's always the details to be worked out more specifically. Um, we talked in depth with um, Gary, and Gary and Susie about the safety issues and the cleaning. I know there were some questions about, you know, between the AM, um, when the AM cohort leaves, do you really have enough time? And, and what I want to say is that, uh, that Gary and his team really, we, they took some time in between the next time that we met. The first time we met, we said, let's ask that question. Gary said, I'm going to go out to every school site. I'm going to visit it. And we're going to work, work with the custodial staff and check, can we get that done within um, a 90 minute window? And he, he came back a week later or a week and a half later and said, yep, we can get that done. And so that, no, so that folks should not worry. Every classroom can be done at every one of our schools from Palo to Indy. Um, and I mean, we were, we were definitely asking the questions because the, the um, uh, elementary planning team was also asking the questions, can we actually really get that done? And so we made sure that the answer to that question was yes, because we knew where there would be safety questions about that. So the cleaning issue, I mean, that, that, that's really where we were. The, I think the elementary team did a fantastic job of going through every model deeply, asking deep questions, doing deep research, and the AMPM came to the top. That's um, the most I can share um, uh, because that's that's what we did. <laughs> Thank you, Nia. Mm -hmm. Joe, and then earlier, I just wanted to say I'd love for our community to understand that the decisions we make are making our science back and data back, and I'm wondering if we could reinforce that by possibly answering their questions on our Q and A on the website the questions that they asked tonight because we weren't able to respond directly. But I think that would be very helpful if they felt like their questions were getting answered and, and saw what basis we're using. I don't know if you want two other board members to agree or, or what. No, we'll, yes. we'll, we were going to update the questions. All right. Thank you. Um, so, Doc, do you want to speak before Susie and Nick, or do you want to wait till after? I just have a really quick comment. Um, I appreciate what Joe said about um, our experts um, creating a plan, and our job is to ensure high quality education. But this is a pandemic, and we can't divorce safety from that high quality education. That's all. Thank you. Susie and Nick, I don't know who would like to go first. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna piggyback on, on what um, uh, Nia had mentioned earlier about uh, cleaning. So um, we did have the meeting uh, with, with the group and so one of the things that we really looked at is, uh, like she said, it's you know within the 90 minute period, are we gonna have enough time to, to clean each classroom? And um, it's gonna be the same level. I know the question that came up earlier is um, the AM, PM, AM group versus the PM group. Um, the, the concern is in the PM group, 
Um, it's all this, you know, uh, the uh, the quality of air and also the cleaning is, you know, a poor compared to the AM group because of the uh, cleaning and, and that happens at night. Um, I do want to, to just let the uh, board know and also the public that we did look at um, the doesn't matter if it's an AM, PM, it's the same um, a disinfecting level, right? So the, the same level of cleaning that we will be doing between the groups. So in the um, mid uh, morning or, or afternoon, uh, between before the P PM group comes in, we will do the same um, type of cleaning. That means in every single classroom, they will be, our, our staff will be going in the classroom disinfecting um, they will also, um, you know, that looking, uh, disinfecting chairs, uh, desks, doorknobs, and high touch uh, areas. Uh, throughout the day, our staff will be um, uh, go cleaning the restrooms as well. Um, so it's not just a one time they go in and clean, but uh, the, you know, the restrooms and also the other areas, common areas, those are the things that we, we will be focusing on while students are in the classrooms. Um, another comment earlier was about the uh, HVAC. Um, so the heating, this is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, the filters, are they going to be replaced? They, yes, we will replace uh, the filters. Um, this, we will replace, the, uh, re replace them more often than what we have in the past, we obviously uh, prior to COVID-19, and that's the plan um, that we have. Um, and also, uh, in terms of um, fresh air um, through the HVAC. So the, our HVAC system can be set with the fan running all the time to get more fresh air in. Um, this is actually part of the new HVAC code. And so that's what we will be doing. So it's, 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 it's a change that we will be implementing in, in, in our, in our um, um, system and that uh, can easily be done. So that means it's just a matter of setting it up so it every uh, fresh air can just go in um, uh, all day. Nick, did you have anything that you wanted to add as well? Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd like to jump in and um, I'm not going to provide an exhaustive list of all of the things that have been um, dominant in conversations uh, with, with staff as we've been planning and, and looking at reopening. Um, you know, just following up on Ms. Chan, um, she did speak very much about um, almost entirely about disinfecting, which I know that they have a good plan to accomplish, but there are several other things that her department is putting in place that she didn't speak to, including um, CDC recommended hand sanitizers, extra hand washing stations, plans for disinfecting bathrooms. So I, I know Ms. Chan and, and Mr. Krebs are, are looking at that in a very expansive way. Um, what I can comment on is the processes that we are developing to be able to put in place in conjunction with the county health department's uh, recommendations. So um, if we looked at that, I think for starters, what I would say is a philosophical change. Um, I think when we were in a non-pandemic regular school atmosphere, there was uh, this uh, natural pressure applied about making it to school, the pressure to come to school, you know, almost um, erring on the side of coming to school, even if you didn't feel 100%. And that's clearly going to have to be a philosophical change. And we're going to need to work with our community, our teachers, our families um, to, to preach the personal responsibility that will be instrumental in keeping everyone safe, you know, so supporting and accommodating families um, when they err on the side of keeping their student home to keep others safe, I think is going to be um, um, a huge undertaking for us. What I would say additionally is besides what the County Health Department is recommending for us, um, the face co coverings, um, they are supporting us, or they are to support us with a, a pre-screening. These are all in the before school phases. Um, recommending at-home temperature checks, um, we, are, we are looking at the, the um, control, um, the governing of, of entering campus. Um, you know, we are looking as the cleaning and disinfecting was spoke to, but even in the school day where there are, you know, processes for practical, uh, practicable distancing. I know that there were comments earlier about how are we going to make sure that we're spaced out. Those are certainly, those are certainly plans that are being um, finalized, discussed. Um, there were also comments about you know, what do we do if there 
um, are symptoms and there are positive tests. Those are, those are all things that we are, you know, well aware of in the process of, of, you know, what's recommended and what's practical that we're, that we are, um, you know, finalizing. We have recommendations from the County Health Department when it comes to, uh, you know, how to respond um, to, to symptoms, um, especially if we find out about a, a positive diagnosis before the county actually has the opportunity to tell us, um, which, is, which is normally who we would uh, expect to hear us. So I know that we um, plan to present uh, to the board next week more expansively uh, on all of these concepts and more, more specifics, and I'll look forward to providing more information then. But I do... Um, I do want to say that um, our leadership, I think, has been so incredibly proactive and expansive, uh, including I know Ms. Ms. Uh, or Superintendent Amadi, um, you know, is working directly with the county uh, Department of Public Health and wants them to look over our rollout plan, um, you know, to, to give us feedback and, and spot out any holes. So we're, um, we're, we're excited to find a way to rise to the challenge and do so in a safe, um, certainly a safe way. Thank you, Nick. I have a comment and then I'll hand it over to Joe. Um, as we're going forward in this plan and their issues do arise, like we planned it a certain way and we realize what, what is our ability to adapt and modify and what's our feedback loop? You mean for, uh, for the board or for the... I just mean in general. So let's say like, like, you know, we have our normal procedures for complaints, but this is a little different, right? We're going to be built into the plan of the, the health and safety plan of, you know, if X, Y, Z occurs, how do we modify our, our plan? And, and how do we make sure we get teachers back involved? How do you know, work with our unions? It, you know, th there's going to be changes along the way as we learn what works and what doesn't. First of all, we're going to work, I know um, Dr. Beats has already started with our team, um, working with our union. So we've already started working and we'll continue to work to figure out all of these things. And in addition to that, our principals are going to be very closely working with their staff. We're going to be all in touch with everybody at all times. I mean, our principals haven't really left and they're coming back sooner than they've ever done. Um, so we'll work together and we'll make sure. And if there, there are issues, we address them, I mean, immediately. And if we know about them, if somebody else wants to let us know, um, our goal is to put the best plan in place, but we know there may be questions, there may be things that aren't working as well, and we adjust. Joe? So I feel my position has been misrepresented in that I am totally and completely aware that this is a pandemic. But I also believe that I started my statement out by saying safety is our first priority. However, our parameters for safety are going to be determined by the health department and we have to adhere to them. So I don't see that as gray area. What I'm saying is that our focus needs to be on high quality learning and teaching. And the safety is a huge part of it, but that's not what we do as a school board. Are there any more comments from the board? All right, <laughs> this is, uh, all right, so uh, given that there are no more questions and comments, um, there is the motion's been moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor um, of, let me go back to make sure that I'm reading this correctly, of moving to a elementary AMPM model, Please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. I'm opposed. Motion passes four to one. We'll move on to secondary. And 
So there are two options in secondary. Um, so the motion that will be have to be moved will be based on the motion you're moving to suggest which plan to discuss. Gary? I'll move that we use. But you went mute. Sorry. I'll move that we uh, adopt the A, B model. Second. Been moved and seconded. Um, discussion. Joe? So, uh, as I've already stated, I'm not the educational expert here, but I am a parent of four children, and I see the 410 model as being very hard to keep my students focused and um, continuing to do their work if they have 10 days in between um, actually attending school. And again, all of the safety factors and everything, I think there's conversation about whether teachers would be moving classes, students would be moving classes, all those kinds of things have to be figured out. Um, but I, um, in listening to uh, Vivian and Nia tonight, I'm feeling like the um, AV model is the best option at this time. Sorry, I was staring at the board packet. Uh, Dot and then Monica. So I am supporting the 10-4 model. Um, and it, again, I don't think we, I, I think our professionals can um, provide high quality education no matter what model we um, choose because they're fantastic. But I can't um, divorce safety from that. And in my opinion, the 10-4 model is a safer model because you have a longer period of time where your kids, where the students are not on campus if there's any symptom development. And there's just less time for exposure. Monica? I think the AB model is, is more similar to what the kids are used to because they're used to having block days. But I do think it would be useful to have um, staff or Parveen or somebody speak to how they're going to clean classes uh, in between periods. Yeah, Ms. Chan can speak to that. Um, yeah, so for this um, option, um, we are not able to clean in between periods just because we don't have enough time. Um, it's, it's not like the A and AM PM model where we have uh, a block of 90 minutes to clean each classroom. For this one, we don't have that. Yeah. And that's why in that option we put in on Wednesday is the um, scheduled deep cleaning. Yeah. And that's when we will do that. Um, and it, obviously, in addition to that uh, nighttime, that's the time when we will be do, doing the cleaning. But in between periods, no. Jason or Praveen, you have your hands up? Well, doc, Dr. Ryman, go ahead and now I'll say something after that. I was just going to add that's, that's a, 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 the same challenge for any secondary model. Um, mm -hmm. There is no, so the 90 minute period of time that's required to clean the campus, in fact, uh, the custodial team let us know it would take more than that amount of time for uh, Castro Valley High School. Um, we wouldn't be able to put a 90 minute block of time in between each class with st students taking six classes, even having it and having three classes per day. Um, it's not possible to do three classes a day with a 90 minute period of cleaning in between. Um, also thinking of students with 90 minutes in between each class, where would the students go during that period of time? So it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge that we're going to need to figure out in terms of how it's being done, handled. Uh, we know this is high on the radar for CVTA. It's high on the radar for us. Uh, it's something that we're thinking about seriously. Um, and it's, I, it's, you know, it's an issue that's not unique to Castro Valley Unified either. I, I just wanted to add, thank you. Um, for all of that, but one of the things, oh, am I on? 
You're on. No, I was, I was just mouthing to Monica that I see her. <laughs> what, one of the things that we really discussed a lot with the county health department, honestly, for like the last four months, has been exactly that. Because it's a lot easier to keep children in elementary school in cohorts because they have the same teacher. But by its nature, secondary education doesn't work that way. So when, they, when we first started and they were like, well, put 20 kids together and we're like, well, that's not how it works. So they, they understand that, we, that children will be moving and the, the direction and the criteria is try to limit as much as you can, which is why all the school districts are looking at three at block periods instead of six periods a day. So the kids aren't going all over the place. And they're looking at group A and group B. So we're just reducing the number of cross-pollination, but we're definitely not able to eliminate it, even with elementary or any, anything else. But, um, but it is a lot more difficult with secondary, and they understand one of the things that is helpful is older children can be taught a lot more to be a lot more responsible. For example, things that came up is perhaps something on their desk that they have with them that they take on. I mean, these are all different ideas that are coming up. So whatever we can do to help our older children to actually follow some rules and keep everything cleaner and do all of that, we will do because it would be a lot harder to ask a first grader to do that than, it, than an older student. Um, so it is, it's just, it's problematic no matter how you look at it. We just have to do a lot of work um, and put a lot of things in place. And then we're going to learn from each other from different districts as well. We're not in isolation. Monica, you have a comment and then I have a, a, a comment question. Yeah, so I'm looking at the 10-4 model in our board packet. I'm assuming then that one you can't clean in between classes either, correct? Yes. Okay. So, okay. Because, because I guess I, I then I'm starting to think. Well, at least the A B of A you have a deep cleaning, and then you have B come in, as opposed to A and they, the cooties stay there all day, or they clean at night. Yeah, at night they clean. Susie, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. At, at night, we, we will have a nightly cleaning. Um, for whether it's the AM, PM, uh, with the elementary, right? So we're doing the AM, I would mentioned earlier, um, in, for the secondary level, same thing. It's the nightly uh, cleanup in addition to the Wednesday deep cleaning. Okay, it's just during in between classes on right. either high school schedule, you cannot clean. Right. And my, my question slash comment is, I mean, we have we will have these kids be wearing masks. Yes. And they will be socially distanced six feet apart. Right, that's the guidance. Um, what about washing hands? I mean, we talked about washing at certain periods, like maybe if you have to walk into 600 Hall, you have to wash your hands, mm -hmm. you know, or if you ha have it in a classroom or certain intervals where in order to enter a certain place, you have to wash your hands. So yes. that you know that you're getting rid of the viral load. Um, and that way you're clean and you're covered. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't know what we're gonna be able to be doing to wipe down desks before somebody else use them or what does that look like for students? And that's where it gets kind of down to the nitty gritty, which I'm sure you'll be working on, but that's what kind of worries me. Yeah, so th what I wanna say is I can tell you that Susie and Gary are working with all of the different groups in Alameda County who have the same positions to come up with as many different ways as we possibly can to keep kids safe. Like some of the things you talked about, I'm sure have come up. I heard a few more today. So those are things that they're gonna work on, but, but if, if Ms. Chan has any more to add, and I know Nick has, might have heard some things, but those are exactly the things that they're talking about. Yeah, so, um, so you mentioned the hand washing stations in addition to what we, that, you know, the, uh, uh, the restrooms we have um, are going to actually put um, uh, additional hand washing stations with the common areas, um, as well as um, have um, hand uh, sanitizers in each classroom 
um, for elementary and then a spray uh, bottle in each cl classroom for the, uh, for the high, uh, secondary. Um, uh, another uh, uh, thing that we've actually just ordered are the touchless um, hand san sanitizers so that where students can just, you know, put their hand out and, and you know, the sanitize, uh, then they can sanitize their hands. And we are going to place those strategically where, um, you know, the, the common areas as well. Um, so those are the things that we are, we've already uh, uh, um, ordered and we'll be receiving um, uh, before uh, school starts. <coughs> Gary, did you have your hand up or are you just waving? No hand up? Okay. No, you're ready. Okay. Dr. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ryman, um, Dr. Ryman was, um, I think you guys were talking about some other 10 minute more to, for washing hands and things like that too. So all of those things will be worked out. Worked out. Are there any other comments by the board? Questions? Monica? And I guess it's, it's still being worked out, like, you know, how you separate kids in chem labs. And it, was, it just occurred to me, like the engineering building, you have, we just have all the, the big computer lab with all the key, shared keyboards and stuff. Lots, lots of details to work out, which is really why it's, it's going to take a long time for us to put all this in place. And remember, that's one of our justifications for having a few weeks. And we didn't say a lot of weeks, but a few weeks, please, to get all this done. So remember, we start with distance learning. We have the next few weeks, and then we have that so that we can get in a really good, solid place. But like you said, computers, doorknobs, all sorts of things. Now, again, I'm going to ask, again, the same question that I asked for elementary, um, you know, reasoning, I mean, you guys gave us two options, and you said that they, they both worked, um, you know, we had preferences listed from the parents, we had preferences talking to the union, um, what, are, what are the differences between the two, and can you tell us, again, why, just so those that are still on the phone that have, were not on earlier, Vivian, did you want to, to explain? Okay. Yeah, so um, the uh, the group, when we asked them to uh, vote on which model they liked best, um, the AB model was a little larger than the 10-4 model, but it wasn't overwhelmingly larger. When we looked at the parent surveys, the 10-4 model was the lowest in parent um, expression that they wanted that. AB was by far a much larger proportion of parents wanted the AB model. So we, the group decided that they would accept whatever the board decided um, because it was not totally evenly split, but not really one group was much, much higher than the other. So the Disadvantages with the ten four model instructionally is the amount of time that's between when students go. So there, uh, but it's also the advantage in terms of um, the virus and the way that it works. So that's where the ten four model came from originally. But it came from a place where everybody practiced the ten four model, including the workplace. So whole families were on the 10-4 model. So in other words, there was a 10-day gap between everybody was in the house for 10 days so that if uh, anyone became symptomatic, then it would come up before they went back into society. But obviously that's not gonna happen here in terms of the families and everybody, everybody's on their own schedule. Um, it doesn't reduce the amount of exposure for teachers either way because they are still exposed to everybody every two weeks, either in two days at a time with a gap or in four days at a time with a gap. So um, the model is, the models are fairly similar in many respects. And I'm sure Dr. Ryman can add more, more to that. No, you did a great job. Right. 
I mean, um, I, I feel like this is a no-win situation. Um, I, I, I do lean toward this one with similar feelings with Dot. I mean, if it was, if the, if the teachers felt kind of like close and I, I know that parents have a really hard time and I think we're all gonna have a really hard time anyway and it's really hard to select a plan that works for everybody. But being able to have this distance in time to be able to mitigate potential, you know, delays and if there is an exposure, how do we do contract tracing in a in a more meaningful way? I think that that, I mean, obviously, I, I, I like that better. Joe? So, Lavender, I understand what you're saying, but my concern would be, would still be that the staff and the teachers are in that situation and are the students are um, changing with them. So um, I know uh, Linda Granger, the ROP superintendent's daughter has COVID. And we talked a long time today where the daughter has to be isolated for two, 14 days and then no symptoms and then Linda has to be isolated for another 14 days and it's really complicated and hard and while I respect the 10 days it, it doesn't fit what I understand the pattern of what COVID is doing right now it's it's the two-week idea and I'm not the health expert either but um, I just think for parents working with their students and having their student not have any direct instruction for 10 whole days would be very difficult. And again, this isn't going to work for everybody or anybody, and it, it's very hard. Da? So the 10-4 doesn't necessarily fall into the the quarantine time um, that you would have if you uh, were identified as actually having an exposure. What the 10-4 does, it just allows more time for, for symptom development. So symptoms can develop anytime between two and 14 days from what we know. Um, so this allows for that to potentially happen if there was an exposure and for, um, for th that a cohort of students to be home for a certain number of days if symptoms develop rather than you know coming and exposing coming and and spending more time outside of their homes that so it doesn't necessarily mean that that we're they're quarantined and it doesn't track with public health orders about quarantine but it's just allowing for time for um, symptoms to arise if they're going to arise. Are there any other comments or questions from the board? All right, the motion um, as uh, first and seconded um, is for the secondary AB model. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say aye. No. No. Um, motion passes 3-2. Um, that does conclude our meeting of the board. I Could I just say what we're going to do next? We are going to bring back an item with all sorts of information on transportation, child nutrition, and all of that. Again, not complete, just to kind of give you a a skeleton of that just for information but mm -hmm. but I want to thank everybody who participated and and the board for all of your comments and great questions and the staff for doing a fabulous job can, can uh, I add just, just one, can I add one thing that I didn't add earlier that I wish I had I just want to reiterate my appreciation for all of the teachers administrators mm -hmm. counselors and certificated staff that were part of the planning team uh, many of them it's after almost all of them, it's after the end of their work year. 
They really worked hard. As you can see, these are really complex issues. Uh, and also Vivian or Ms. Peritor and Ms. Rashichi for their work. Uh, and, and the board, thank you also for voting. Okay. Uh, although it seems I didn't agree with the decisions tonight, um, I am so grateful for all of the experts that we have had um, providing input in this and developing these plans. And I have every confidence that um, our students will receive the highest quality education that we can provide during this horrible pandemic. Um, and like uh, Netta said earlier um, in her comment that this is nothing is ideal here. So thank you. Joe, do you have any closing statements? No? Gary, do you have any closing statements? Monica, do you have any closing statements? Just quickly to thank the staff for everything they've done and all the information they provided. And um, I know we asked a lot of hard questions and um, hopefully a lot of the parents got most of their answers and the rest um, we can put in the Q&A. And Parveen, I took a lot of notes, so if you feel like you're short. Yeah, well, you, yeah actually, if you take a picture of it and send it to me, that'd be great. But we have um, FAQs already started. It's in my note hand, so I'll have yeah, to Yeah, that's okay. But no. just, just, I hope that people can be patient and give us a couple of days to put them online. Uh, but we'll do our best to get it. I know I'm sending something out tonight um, with just general information of what happened tonight, and then we'll um, definitely update the, uh, the frequently asked questions. Thank you so much. Um, so with that, I do want to thank our families who called in. Um, I am sorry for the everything that everyone is going through. Um, this is a tough situation uh, for everyone, no matter where you are and whatever walk of life that you have. Um, we know this is complex. We thank the teachers. We thank CSCA for their commitment to keeping our schools safe and clean. And I'm really looking forward to seeing more of the safety details so that we can help our families, our teachers, um, our students um, and the district uh, learn more about how to manage their safety in this horrible, horrible, awful time. So with the lovely news that all of that that goes with today that we had, and um, there's a lot of work here, um, a lot of positive energy and commitment to working together. So I appreciate you all and all that you're doing, all that you will be doing. And I wish you a good night. Thank you.